Good morning, everyone. If you please kindly take your seats. We are about to get started. It is so good to, to see everyone this morning. Uh, and good morning, LGBTQIA plus community members and allies. And thank you for joining us today to celebrate Pride Month. And on behalf of Secretary Becerra, who you will hear from shortly, uh, welcome to your Department of Health and Human Services. My name is Marvin Figueroa. I'm the Director of the Office of Intergovernmental and External Affairs here at HHS, and we're so delighted to have you here with us today. Throughout the day, administration and HHS leaders will detail the historic actions taken by the Biden-Harris administration to ensure that the LGBTQI plus communities, youth, adults, families, caretakers, and providers have the resources and support they need, but also deserve. This will be a moment of reflection, of honor, of celebration, and hope. We will draw from the lessons we've learned to guide us towards the future. And we should take a moment as well throughout today to think about those who have fought for civil rights for the LGBTQI plus A community. Some, we know their names, but many of them have done this without, anonymously. And we're so delighted for this and honored by their sacrifice, and we will continue to carry the torch moving forward. It is my honor to introduce to you today Secretary Bracera. Few are as committed, to him, uh, as committed as him to the LGBTQIA plus community to ensure the equal treatment, but also being seen and being heard. Secretary Bracera is an advocate, an ally, and those of us who work at HHS see his commitment daily to the fair and equal treatment of all Americans, particularly to allow them to, to be who they are, love who they want to love, and to be treated with, fully, with full equity. It is my distinct honor not only to work with him, but for him. And with that, I welcome to the stage Secretary Javier Becerra. Good morning, everyone. I'm a little under the weather, otherwise I'm, this isn't my usual voice. Although it's not a bad one, right? Why wouldn't I keep it? Uh, I want to say thank you to all of you who are here. Thank you for the reason you are here. And thank you for partnering with us on why you are here. Uh, happy Pride Month. I hope you have all had an opportunity to not just enjoy June and what it stands for, but have had a chance to actually march, to stand up, to do the things that this month is supposed to stand for and uh, have an opportunity to remind people that there will be more. And that's why our summit's uh, theme is so important. It's not just protecting what we have, but it's expecting much more. And I hope that's why we are here, because this game of defense can get tiring. We want offense. We want offense. And so I know that I speak for so many throughout the world not just America, but so many throughout the world as I've traveled. I know that when the U.S. gets into international fora and we speak without equivocation about the need to protect the rights of everyone in the world, all humanity, and we mention the need to have reproductive rights throughout the world, the need to have protection for those who are from our LGBTQI plus community, it's important because it symbolizes something, especially now in America when we know we're not protecting the rights of all women and childbirth age in this country, when we know we're not protecting people because of the differences they may have with others in this country. And so it is constantly something we must do to not just protect, but let's play some offense and let's grow, let's build. And so thank you for being here. You know, I. Usually, and I do, I have a lot of stats, a lot of things that we've done at HHS, but I'm going to spare you that because I see doc, Dr. Rachel uh, Levine, Admiral Levine, our uh, Assistant Secretary of Health, who is here. There are many others who will speak during the summit who will tell you about all the things that we're all doing. 
in or outside of government, but certainly for those of us in the Biden administration. You're going to hear from folks throughout the Biden administration and, of course, from here at HHS about what we're doing, not just during Pride Month, but throughout, throughout our service. And what I want to mention to you is that as you walked in, I hope you noticed that you're walking into a special place. This isn't just the Department of Health and Human Services. It's the first place in the federal government that raised the pride flag, the rainbow flag, here in America to symbolize that we are a place of protection, but a place that also understands our role in advancing the rights of all Americans. And every time we lift that flag, we hope we send a message, not to you, but to those who don't want to be here. Because this is where HHS is. This is what we do. And so let me mention a couple of things that I think are important because I believe much of what the entire world would like to see and certainly those who are from the LGBTQI plus community would like to see is pride in all of its leaders in standing up for so many. And so I want you to know that when we come to work, we understand that equity must infuse everything we do. I, uh, there was a term I learned a while ago, equity by design. To me, HHS is the perfect place to demonstrate that we are an instrument that recognizes that equity must be by design in everything we do. And so that is why I have crossed the country. I have met with trans teens to find out how we can serve them better. We have met with folks who have been attacked during Pride Month. We have met with those who are seeing their children denied the gender-affirming care that they need. And we know that those are our families, those are our kids, those are our teens in school. And so we're going to do everything we can because we know that targeting some targets all of us. We know that if we stand up for st some, we will end up standing up for all of us. And that's what HHS wants to symbolize. Our design, as we do our work, must include that. When we raised the flag earlier this month, it was interesting that in such a short order of time, I was no longer able to say we are the first and only agency who has hung that flag at the very top of this building. It was great to see that we were joined by essentially the U.S. federal government, the Biden administration, to do that. We must figure out a way to expand. We must figure out a way to get all those Americans who don't realize it, but they're on our side. We have to figure out how we get all those Americans who have a conception that with just a little bit of approach will turn into a support for what we are trying to achieve. And so I say to each and every one of you, this summit is not just to gather with friends and fellow champions. It's not just an opportunity to hear the latest of what HHS and this administration are doing. It's not an opportunity to just protect the gains that have been made and to celebrate during Pride Month where we go from here. It's to recognize that most Americans are with us if we could just sit down with them. And because we won't have a chance to sit down with the vast humanity that's in this country and beyond, we have to figure out another way. And that's where you come in. That's why this summit is here, because we have to move faster. There are too many people who are being hurt. When I was speaking to a, this group of teen high school students, this was it's within this month, one of the girls opened up, excuse me, one of the individuals opened up, she goes by they. She met, they mentioned how 
it was no longer easy to go home, now living in a homeless shelter, something classmates that were sitting around the room with this individual did not know. But she said something really interesting, and that's what I want to leave you with, because at the end of the day, I'm sitting before the leaders who are going to make it possible for us to turn that adversary into future doctors, future teachers, future scientists, future cabinet secretaries, future president of the United States. She said, they said something very important. You just muscle through. To hear a 15-year-old say, I'm just going to muscle through this, homelessness, the adversity, not being able to go home, it makes you recognize how tough you have to be. But it also shows you the strength. You just got to muscle through. I guarantee you, that American is going to be a future scientist, doctor, teacher, cabinet secretary, president, because what was articulated that, that morning by so many of them, but this particular individual showed a fortitude, an ability to somehow surpass all the odds. And I hope what we learn is that we can do that too. And we convene today because we recognize that we must do that too. And that's why we are here. So when we say we are protecting our gains and advocating for more, just walk outside to be reminded by that flag. We mean it. We're going to do it. We hope to enlist you. We hope you're there. We hope you can get us to do more because there are too many people who are muscling through at the ripe age of 15 who deserve to have us muscling a lot harder. And so let us muscle through this together. I thank you for being here. We will make this happen. Thank you very much. Let me turn it back over to Marvin Figueroa. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, we're going to do something you normally don't do during a summit. We're going to talk to each other. Um, we got five minutes. And I want you to turn to your neighbor to your left um, or the person behind you if you're in the front row. And I want you to introduce yourself. Uh, what inspired you to be here today? And what does more look like to you? So I have a timer. Five minutes starts now. All right, y'all, we'll, we'll come back. I think that's the issue with giving folks time to talk, right? hard to bring them back. Thank you all for, for taking the time to kind of think through those three questions. We're going to come back and have the opportunity to share. Um, but I want to press pause and introduce Corinne Jean-Pierre, who you all know as the White House Press Secretary. I can take as much time as I want and kind of read her extensive bio, but you all know that she is a trailblazer, a champion for equity, and when she speaks, she speaks on behalf of the president. With that, I would love to bring White House Press Secretary Corinne Jean-Pierre to stage. Hi, everybody. Hi. I have a couple of things to say. This podium is so much smaller than mine. <laughs> so thank you, thank you, Marvin. Um, thank you all for, for being here today. Thank you for having me here today. Happy Pride Month to all of you. I want to also thank uh, Secretary Becerra as well. I'm honored to be here with you a true uh, leader in the administration's work to advance equality uh, to the LGBTQ plus community. So thank you again, Secretary Bracera, for being such a leader, uh, not just in the uh, HHS uh, agency, but clearly for the community as well, a strong ally. 
And thank you uh, to your team, especially Lee and Marvin, who just obviously introduced me from the Intergovernmental and External Affairs Office for organizing this first Pride Summit. So again, thank you for having me. And some of my colleagues, I believe, are here as well. Dr. Dimitri, hello, if you're here. There you go. Harold Phillips is here as well. There you go. And also Admiral Levine, one of my heroes. So there's Shiro's in this fight every day, working to make lives better. So thank you, Admiral. It's always wonderful to see you. And uh, so, look, as the first openly queer person to hold the position of press secretary, White House press secretary. <laughs> I have learned a lot this year, and I've seen a lot. I think we all have. It's been a scary year, a very difficult year. But one thing I can say for sure, being in my position, is that representation matters. It matters at the White House podium. It matters in agencies like HHS. It matters who is sitting at the table, making incredibly important policy decisions, as we have seen through these last two years of this administration, especially as it relates to our community. And that is what you all do, right? That is what the fight that you all are doing, lifting up our community, making sure that that representation is at that table. So it is so critical and important. So I want to thank you. Thank every, each and every one of you for everything that you do every day. Because representation matters always. But particularly right now, when you have transphobic politicians and so many others who are breeding, breeding hate, over a dozen states have enacted anti-LGBTQ plus laws that violate our more basic values and freedoms as Americans and are cruel and they are careless, callous to our kids, our neighbors, and those in our community. More than 600 anti-LGBTQ plus bills have been filed in state houses across the country and a significant portion of these bills target, they target transgender youth. Now, as the president says all the time, these young people are some of the bravest people he knows, but no one should have to be brave just to be who they are, just to be themselves. That's coming from the commander in chief, the president, which is so important and critical in this time. Now, as you all know, the entire Biden-Harris administration stands with the LGBTQ plus community and has their backs in the face of these attacks. This month, we joined Americans across the country to celebrate the strength, resilience, and bravery, bravery of the LGBTQ plus community and reaffirm our commitment to fighting for equality and freedom for all people. It is why the president has taken historic steps to advance equality of the LGBTQ plus community and protect civil rights. He was proud to sign the executive order directing federal agencies to protect LGBTQ plus families and youth support, and also support youth when it comes to mental health and stop harmful conversion therapy policies. DOJ is actively supporting challenges to state laws that target transgender kids. And in light of the Dobbs decision, which we just, as you all know, the one year anniversary just happened, just this past Saturday, he took action to protect marriage equality by signing into law the Respect for Marriage Act this past December. I think some of you were there when we, when we celebrated that. So he continues to call on Congress to pass the Equality Act to enshrine civil rights, protections for LGBTQ plus Americans in federal law. And in, this, in the celebration of Pride Month, leading into that celebration a couple weeks ago, the Biden-Harris administration announced a new, new actions to protect LGBTQ plus communities from attacks on their rights and safety, including strengthening physical safety through new resor resources to better protect pride, celebrations, marches, community centers, healthcare providers, 
and small businesses advising civil rights violation by appointing a new coordinator to protect LGBTQ plus students from book bans, which make it harder for kids to learn and may violate civil rights laws. Strengthening mental health and other support resources by supporting more funding to help support kids and their families protect LGBTQI plus kids in foster care and end LGBTQ plus youth homelessness. So we have made progress, as you just heard me lay out, but we know this is far from over and the Biden-Harris administration will continue our focus on advancing equality for LGBTQ plus people across the country. But the bottom line is this, the administration will never stop fighting to end discrimination, to end against unjust laws, that target the LGBTQ plus community and to guarantee everyone the fundamental rights. And that is the fundamental rights to make sure that we have our freedom, we have our voice, and we have our protections. Now, I wanna say in closing, because as I started at the top, this has been a very difficult year if you are part of our community. And the fact that we have this president who I just laid out has taken actions to make sure that we are all protected, but the fight continues. And I know when things are so hard and things are so difficult, it puts some heaviness on our hearts, heaviness on who we are in this time. So I do wanna say to everyone in front of me here today, you are perfect just as you are. And not just that, you are loved. And this is a president that has your back. We have your back. And just always know that. Because your identity is not your weakness. Your identity is your superpower. Let me just say that one more time. Your identity is your superpower. You are exactly, exactly who you need to be in this space, in this world, and never forget that. So I know when I walked in, you all were doing an exercise. So if you will indulge me for a second, I'd love to do an exercise with all of you. If everyone can stand up. because I want you all to always remember this. Look at to the person to your left and say, <laughs> whatever your left is. <laughs> you are enough. I want everybody to say it. Again, again. No kissing, please. Come on. <laughs> Not at work, <laughs> after hours. Let's do this. You are, you are enough. Let's say it again, louder. You, you are, are enough. enough. One more time. You are enough. The last, last thing I would love to, for you all to say to each other. We are enough. We are enough. One more time. We are enough. One more time. Let's say it really loud. We are Please always remember that. One last thing I'll say and then I promise to leave. <laughs> I have an eight-year-old daughter and some of you who may have heard me speak, I talk about her a lot. She's actually nine now, she just turned nine. She is one of the most amazing little humans that I know. Obviously she's my kid, so. That's why I'm biased. Um, and I say to her, to her, what I say to all of these, the trans, trans kids youth that are out there is that I want them to dream big. I want them to be able to be who they are and to be comfortable in their truth. 
and I want the same thing that I want for my daughter for them. And it is so important that we make sure that we have their backs in this time, in this incredibly difficult time. Because in those 600 pieces of legislation that I just talked about, a few hundred of them attack, go after trans kids and their families. So I'll say this the way I started this, which is thank you, thank you, thank you so much for everything that you do. Because the work that you do every day in this agency, for this administration, is saving lives and protecting lives. So never, ever forget that. Sometimes we live in a bubble, but this is going to have ripple effects. So just know, thank you so much. We appreciate you from the bottom of our hearts. And thank you for protecting and fighting for our community. Thanks. Y'all, welcome to HHS, where our summits are interactive. <laughs> so I'll introduce our, our first panel, uh, the administration's accomplishments and current landscape. Uh, while I introduce the panelists, please uh, take your seats, Mr. Panelists. First is Demetrius Daskalakis. White House National MPOX Deputy Coordinator. He will serve as today's panelist. Carol Johnson, <laughs> Administrator, Health Resources Services Administration, also known as HRSA. And Brian Altman, Director of the National Mental Health, <laughs> Director of the National Mental and Substance Use Policy Lab, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, also known as SAMHSA. Welcome to the panelists. I think that means we're on. Good morning, everybody. There you go. Thank you so much for coming. Happy Pride. And uh, really, I think um, we're going to have a really great conversation. We're going to get through a couple of presentations. We're going to trim a little time off the end so we can get back on time. So we're going to go straight to audience questions. So I will start. Um, so my role, um, I actually um, come from CDC. So I'm a member of the HHS family, where I work in the Division of HIV Prevention. Today, I am really speaking from the White House perspective as the Deputy Coordinator for the National MPOX response. But here's an amazing secret. It is not just the White House perspective. HHS has been really the key organization that has been so important in ending or controlling, not ending, very not, not ending, but controlling this outbreak. So um, this is a case study in how you run a community-driven endemic response, and my colleagues to my left are really, I think, going to demonstrate how important that collaboration and that strategy is. So I will give you a brief situation update just to remind you, in fact, that this outbreak is not over, but that we are still working feverishly to control it. Um, as of June 21st, the most recent data show that there have been 30,505 uh, cases or people with MPOX in the United States. I'm going to talk about the demographics in a second. Importantly, 43 people have passed away. That's important. I want you to file that in the back of your mind because we're going to talk a lot about that in a moment and really show why a, a response that really weaves together infectious diseases, HIV, mental health, and housing really come together to, to generate a response that is more effective. So. This is what the MPOX story has looked like since the beginning of the outbreak. So looking back all the way to May 2022, you can see that there was a peak around the summer of 2022 with around 450 cases on average on the highest day. But you can also see what success looks like with a curve going down. So that orange line represents the average number of cases per day in the US. And you can see that it's really hard to see how many cases there are at the end because, oh, no slides. I see them great. <laughs> They're totally so great. Spreading. They're so lovely. <laughs> there we go. 
So now I'm going to get up and point at it. So um, you can see that there's uh, that orange line really shows success. So the peak was around 400 cases. I'm going to just show you again, 30,505 cases, 43 deaths. So you can see what the peak looks like. And this is the kind of epidemic curve that public health folks love to see because it goes right down and it stays down. Are we okay for it to stay down forever? No. We have work to do. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about that as well. But we are in a very significantly different place. And I think as I tell you the story of this outbreak, you will see why. And again, a lot of love to all of the HHS oper operative div divisions that have been so critical, as well as HUD, in um, early addressing this. This is what the most recent numbers look like. I had to zoom in because the numbers are so low. On average, one to two cases per day, some days zero. But what's important is not only the number, but also the who. So the majority of these are happening in cisgender men, although transgender men and women are overrepresented in this outbreak as well. Um, additionally, when you look at the race and ethnicity of the people who have been diagnosed with MPOX in the United States, 60% have been, have been black and Latinx. So it really does speak to Secretary Becerra's importance comment about really doing equity by design and you will see what efforts were taken to really try to make this response about equity yet still have the challenges that really face our country every day in terms of the equity issues so speaking of challenges um, we um, have launched the largest vaccine effort in the world for mpox in the united states that's really important so 1.2 million doses of vaccine have been administered you can see that at the very end this trails off and so that is a point of a lot of concern but i have some good news the last week we actually have had as many vaccines administered as we did in January 2022, like in one, in a single week, or 23, sorry. So what we're seeing is an upscale, an uptick in vaccination, which is really important, and I'm gonna make the point now. So CDC has released mathematical models that ask the question, how much do we have to vaccinate to prevent MPOX, and how much do we have to vaccinate to prevent larger outbreaks? And so what they found was that the more immunity that you have in the population, the better you do. So the, the less likely you're going to have any MPOX outbreaks. They then ask the question, is there a line, a threshold um, of vaccination that if you are under, you're at risk for larger outbreaks than the belly of the outbreak that we had in 2022? And that answer is about 30 to 35 percent of people need to be vaccinated in order to prevent uh, an MPOX outbreak of equal or larger magnitude to uh, what we've experienced in 2022. So where are we in terms of the work? Remember I said that it wasn't all good news, that we have work to do? It is good news to do work, though. It's exciting to do work because you can actually address equity. So here's what we know so far. In terms of one dose of vaccine, 37% of folks are vaccinated with that first dose. Now, that provides some protection, but that's not the highest level of protection that you can get. You need that second dose. And that second dose, about 23% of people are vaccinated. So. Um, Forecasts are forecasts, and action is action. Though the forecasts say that we're at risk for a larger outbreak, we know the action that we need to take to prevent it. So that means that we need to um, continue vaccinating. And when you look at vaccinations, there's a really important equity story as well. So despite a lot of intentionality to make sure that we launched um, the effort to improve vaccine equity as well as equity in this outbreak, the fault lines that continue to be challenges to equity in the U.S. have been challenges to the MPOX outbreak as well. So overall, um, for every one white person who was diagnosed for MPOX, 43 um, received a vaccine. For every single Latinx person or Hispanic person diagnosed with MPOX, 17 received a vaccine. And for every black person diagnosed with MPOX, 9 received a vaccine, which really tells us that we need to keep pushing to make sure that we can achieve a higher level of equity. And this is sort of where I leave talking about where, um, where we are today and would like to tell you the story of the MPOX syndemic. And so that word is, is a special word. So I'm going to ask you, who knows what a syndemic is? All right, so this is like where, this is where like, this is where I wish I had a survey because I, I survey you now and none of you know or three of you know. And then at the end, you all know, which means successful learning. So here, here, here we go. So a syndemic is an epidemic that interacts with each other and by that interaction, increase their adverse effects on the health of communities that face systematic, structural, and other inequities. All of those are lots of words. I like pictures better. So 
Mpox actually entered this endemic of HIV, STI, and mental health. What I mean by that is that Mpox seems to interact with HIV, seems to interact with STIs, and seems to interact with mental health and substance use. It could be because they live in similar populations. It could be something biological about them. But that's not where the story ends. When you take these interacting epidemics and then you add negative social determinants of health, like racism, homophobia, transphobia, and housing instability, what happens is you make the, that little ball of interacting epidemics much denser and way more able <clears throat> to impact the communities that can't afford to be impacted. I'm going to stop here and say for one second, it's not just about social determinants, it's also about legal determinants. So when you hear about um, laws that are affecting LGBTQ people, trans people, other folks, those are actually direct attacks that will then result in a worsening outbreak. So this is just MPOX. It's going to be the same for HIV. I need to shout out that also so um, things that threaten people's security, like gun violence, is also an important piece of this. And um, plug for HHS, recent release of a great toolkit that is about emergency preparedness for LGBTQ people, and they actually specifically look at mass shootings. So important to take a look at that one as well. All of that plays in to making an outbreak and interacting epidemics much worse. Here's the real live story of how this happened. So looking at MPOX, data from CDC revealed that 38% of people diagnosed with MPOX in the US were also diagnosed with HIV. 41% had an STI, a sexually transmitted infection, in the year prior to their, um, in the year prior to their MPOX diagnosis. Sort of saying they kind of live in the same zip code in the same population, but now they're made worse by each other. That same study showed that people with MPOX and HIV were more likely to feel sicker they were more likely to be hospitalized, but it didn't end there. If their HIV was under less stringent control, if, they were, if their viral load was not undetectable, if their T cells were much lower, the outcomes were way worse. More people were hospitalized, but the story goes on. Soon after that, the CDC released uh, the story of 57 of their sickest people that they heard about, about with MPOX in the United States. What they found was chilling. 82% of the people, 82, were living with HIV. 72% of the people living with HIV had the lowest immune systems that you could imagine, less than 50 T cells. Less than 10% of them were, were on HIV medicines. And as I told you about a syndemic, those isms all come together, racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, homelessness. And what you can see is in these hospitalizations, almost 70% were black and 23% were homeless. <clears throat> Not surprisingly, <clears throat> when you looked at homeless people, which is what they did in Los Angeles, so people experiencing homelessness and MPOX, they found very similar findings. 60% of the people in Los Angeles who were homeless with MPOX were living with HIV and only half of them were virally suppressed. So really, that's what a syndemic looks like. The U.S. syndemic then gets documented in a uh, very significant way when CDC reports out on the 38 deaths that were um, reported as of March 7th, uh, up to March 7th, uh, 2023. And this is where all the work that you're going to hear about on this stage becomes so important. So as I said to you, <clears throat> interacting epidemics happen either because of the population that infections occur in or health challenges, or because of something biological about the, about the, the health challenges. They're made worse by social circumstances. So looking at the deaths from MPOX, 93% of them were living with HIV. <clears throat> only one of the deaths, only one human had been vaccinated. Almost all of them had T cells less than 50, and almost none of them took medicines. And they're made worse by social circumstances. So the majority, 87% were black. Most happened in the South, 47%. Um, cisgender men represented the majority. And <clears throat> of the people who had data on housing, 45.5% were homeless. I think you all understand what a syndemic is now, yeah? Okay, so that's why it's so important that we address things in that way. And so now I'm going to talk about my love letter to uh, the Biden administration, to HHS, and to HUD. What happened before we even saw the data, um, we knew that this was going to be a syndemic. And even before the data was released from CDC, all of the, HUD age, all of the HHS agencies that were uh, involved stepped up and created historic flexibility in how their resources could be used and historic flexibility in, um, in how staffing could be used. 
HRSA through Ryan White, CDC through their HIV STI funding, SAMHSA, as well as HUD said that you could use those resources to address um, MPOX, really a critical step. And it meant that we could use all the toolkits in the MPOX toolkit. That means vaccine, it means testing so folks know their status, and then also knowledge so people could make informed decisions about their social and sex lives. Additionally, we said this doesn't live in isolation. MPOX is not alone. So really, how can we weave together the other things that people need to be ready for summer and be ready for their lives? Traveler's health had to be a part of this, given what we know about MPOX. Sexual health, whether it's HIV or STI. COVID-19 vaccination and also mental health, including overdose prevention, were a key component of the work to address the MPOX outbreak. That has been manifested by CDC and all of the collaboration with HHS through a great website that tells people how to get ready for summer, really, really focusing on the LGBTQI plus community. And all those components are in there. It's not just about sex, not just about MPOX, it's about all of it. Reminding people that holistic care and holistic strategies are so critical, something that my colleagues next to me will exemplify in great detail. Now, with that said, I'm also going to shout out um, one of my favorite humans in the world, Admiral Levine, who declared, appropriately, a summer of pride. And so part of the summer of pride <clears throat> that was declared is that <clears throat> we... <clears throat> we are going to work across agencies to do something that really focuses on events that reach black and brown people who could benefit from vaccination. So we're calling it our Summer of Pride Cross Agency Syndemic Tiger Team. It is led out of HHS with some help from ONAP and the White House team, as well as um, from folks within OASH and uh, OIDP. We have folks from CDC and HRSA working on grantees and public health departments. We have folks from CDC doing engagement <clears throat> We have fabulous humans from, uh, from SAMHSA working to make sure that we don't just do infectious diseases, but we also include mental health considerations, people from HUD and HOPWA, and yes, also from NIH, so we can help recruit the study that we need to recruit so we understand um, how to treat MPOX. And so what we're doing is <clears throat> engaging with the community to identify events and areas that we know are at risk for MPOX resurgence using CDC's forecasts. We're finding about 30 of these large events and we're going to go whole hog, that's a scientific word. And so what we're doing is we're really going to engage with the community and engage with the local health departments to be able to actually launch a, a very syndemic focused strategy to these events that supplement the syndemic focused strategy in, in traditional settings. If we find places that have a wellness plan already, great. If we find them that don't, we're going to help them make sure they have one, and we're going to try to tell the story so folks know how we did. So that's really what I have to present, and I wanted to say thank you again for having me. Thanks to Secretary Becerra, uh, and I will hand the mic over to Carol Johnson, who has her own mic. <laughs> So much. Um, I'm just delighted to be here um, with so many friends. Um, it's so great to see you. Happy Pride. Um, it is wonderful, as always, to be on a panel with Dimitri and Brian. I love being um, at events with Dimitri because I'm from New Jersey and everyone says I talk fast. Um, and when I shout <laughs> out, <laughs> and Dimitri's words per minute are faster than mine. So, <laughs> um, just to talk a little bit about, I know many of you know us at the Health Resources and Services Administration for our work in the Ryan White program. Many of you know, I like to think of Ryan White as the program that did social determinants of health before it had a name. Um, this is the way that we're really delivering care um, to people with HIV in a holistic, comprehensive way and really thinking about all those touch points both in the clinic, in the community, and um, encouraging and recruiting people to get in care and stay in care through people with lived experience and community health workers and peer support specialists, and increasingly working to make sure people with HIV um, get the substance use disorder treatment that they need, the mental health supports they need, um, and continue to build that wrap in the most comprehensive way possible. Um, but we do that not only through our Ryan White work, but also through our partnership with the community health centers that we support throughout the country. There are 1,400 community health centers operating 15,000 sites around the country that offer healthcare services regardless of individual's ability to pay. Um, that is increasingly our partner in the ending the HIV epidemic um, uh, relationship so that we can, because Ryan White is focused on individuals with HIV, using our health center footprint to make sure that we can identify people at risk um, and do all the testing and supports that we need to make sure that people are getting connected to care. 
It is also through our community health center program that we run our healthcare for the homeless program, where I have met incredible leaders around the country who are supporting in particular LGBTQ youth um, who experience homelessness at an unprecedented rate um, and really need the kind of health care supports um, as well as a host of social services supports um, to put them on the best possible footing going forward. If we're going to address that um, synda syndromic, syndemic, syndemic, syndemic um, I've, I'm always, I'm, I'm, I strongly vote for new terminology. Um, <laughs> um, that intersection, though, um, we have to make sure that people get the proper primary care, get the proper health care supports necessary to be to thrive, um, and while we're ensuring that all of those social services supports are, are, are available. We also have a very strong footprint in rural communities across the country. As many of you know, um, the needs of LGB LGBTQ individuals in rural communities are, can be particularly acute because of concerns about stigma, because of concerns about um, access, and we work closely across all of our programs to improve access in rural communities. We also are the part of the HHS that invests in building the primary care and healthcare workforce. We are training more mental health and substance use providers. We are training more nurses, more primary care providers, uh, more physician assistants and nurse practitioners to really build out the capacity of the nation to deliver on our primary care goals, including making sure that mental health and substance use are part of primary care. Um, and to do that, we need to make sure that that next generation of the healthcare workforce um, understands the needs of the LGBTQ community, um, understands what um, prevention looks like, what treatment looks like, what connecting people to services look like, and what cultural humility looks like in healthcare delivery. Um, so uh, we have spent much of the last year visiting many of our grantees and recognizing that um, as our Ryan White program continues the work to ensure that people with HIV are connected to care, that where those gaps in care are are really with individuals from minority communities. Um, and so we have strong partnerships. These are some of our, our HIV, um, our, our Ryan White grantees at Howard, at Charles Drew University, really working to make sure we're building out our footprint with our HCBU partners. We have a wonderful partnership with Meharry. There are only a handful of HCBU medical schools around the country. We have partnerships with most of them and are continuing to grow our partnerships um, to make sure that we're building that footprint, not only um, with current healthcare providers, but with the next generation. Um, as Dimitri mentioned, we all surged across HHS as part of the MPOX response. Um, we were part, at HRSA, we were able to um, get our own direct allocation of vaccine and be able to provide it directly to Ryan White Clinics to supplement and augment what they were getting from their states. If there were, if there were issues or challenges in getting vaccine from their states, we were able to respond. We also, as Dimitri mentioned, were able to provide some flexibility in our grant dollars. Um, that sounds like a nice thing to do. In practice, it is a critical thing to do. Um, the idea of being able to use money you already have available and not waiting for a potential supplemental from Congress or other funds to become available made it so that people could surge immediately which was really important to our grantees around the country. Um, I had the opportunity to visit our MPOX uh, vaccine clinic at Fenway Health in Boston, um, you know, Saturday afternoon, a very full room. Um, demand was high, um, and we, um, what we learned was uh, how important acting quickly is and how important um, that flexibility in our grant dollars really was to the response, and we'll continue to build on that. As many of you know, in the Ryan White program, we have, um, we have now reached close to 90% viral suppression of people who are engaged in care. Um, if you look historically from 2010 to today, that is a dramatic leap. Um, that is uh, something that we're quite proud of, but we know there is much more work to do. Until that number is 100%, until 100% are people engaged in care, our work is far from done. And so, you know, the title of this session, I think, is um, uh, celebrating our gains and recognizing what we need to do going forward. Um, this is an incredible accomplishment, not um, of HRSA. This is an accomplishment of the community. Um, and it is, uh, but it is also a marker of how much further we need to go. Um, and as with many things, that, um, that next tranche of um, success here is often harder um, because there are people who, um, who are distrustful of the healthcare system for a host of 
of, of really important reasons that we all need to appreciate and understand um, and work together to overcome. And then one of the other things that we're really focused on in Ryan White is thinking about individuals um, who are aging. Uh, as many of you know, I'm not, I feel like I'm telling you things that you all could tell me and I've learned from so many of you. Um, but for many people who are, who are aging, you know, more than half of our Ryan White clients are over the age of 50. Um, and if you, for people who came of age in the 80s and um, early 90s, um, you know, the, uh, many of their friends and family, many of their friends passed, many of their families abandoned them. There's a sense of um, loneliness and isolation that we need to support people and work through and provide those critical supports that so many of us are now, you know, focused on caring for our aging parents, um, for individuals, uh, for the LGBTQ community, um, for some of the some individuals with HIV. We need to provide that same kind of support um, and make up for that um, incredible um, deficiency that results from discrimination um, at the start of the epidemic. We're also working very hard to expand our outreach efforts, to engage people where they are, to be in the community um, more and more, including at a host of Pride events um, over the last month. This is our team at um, AFRAM in, in Baltimore, one of the largest um, uh, events on the East Coast. We're continuing to go where people are, be where people are, be part of the conversation, engage communities that are not always connected to care, um, or who can be trusted messengers in getting more people connected to care. Um, and then it's really important for us at HRSA to not just talk the talk, but walk the walk internally. And so we have a very robust, and we're really just so grateful for our employee resource group, our LGBTQ employee resource group, our pride group at HRSA that works every day um, to make sure that we're doing the education and support for our staff um, so that our staff is as culturally competent as possible and so that we're challenging ourselves to make sure that the people who do the work are representative of the communities that we serve. Um, and so there's so much more to do. There's so many um, things ahead, um, but we are delighted to be able to be partners with you in this work. We sort of, uh, we know how much what we have been able to do is, is because of your leadership, because of your partnership, because of you telling hard truths to all of us across this in administration as we work to really support all that the LGBT community needs. And with that, I'm gonna turn it to Brian. Thank you so much, Dimitri and uh, Carol. It's a pleasure to be here on behalf of the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. Um, an agency that really has a vision that anybody at risk for living with or in recovery from substance use or mental health conditions um, gets the quality, accessible, equitable care that they deserve, they achieve well-being, and they thrive. Um, so where we start uh, is our guiding principles, which include equity, trauma-informed approaches, recovery, and last but not least, our commitment to data and evaluation and evidence. And so it's important to start with the data. In June 13th of this year, we released a new report, LGB Behavioral Health, um, from our 2021 and 2022 National Survey on Drug Use and Health, or what we call NISDA. Uh, NISDA is a household survey of approximately 67,000 Americans across the country. And since 2015, we've been collecting LGB data for adults 18 and older. And when we get to the part where I'm supposed to talk about how we're moving forward, I'll tell you uh, how it's been limited. I recognize that, but we're moving forward. But for now, we have the LGB adult data. And um, as I'm sure uh, none of you will be surprised about, it, it's not good. Um, and why I want to emphasize that it, it, it's not good, not because LGBTQI plus people in and of them themselves are more likely to have a behavioral health condition. It's because of the discrimination, the stigma, the harassment, and the bullying that LGBTQI people face that makes them more susceptible to the behavioral health conditions. I also want to emphasize that a lot of times I think people really do know that individuals who are LGBTQI plus probably have a greater prevalence of mental health conditions, but it is not mental health conditions alone. Whenever we've done this survey data, we found that essentially across all 10 of the illicit substances 
um, that we track, LGBTQI plus people have higher rates than um, straight or heterosexual people. We don't see this in other demographics. Other demographics sometimes have higher rates based on race or ethnicity for a particular illicit substance, but not all 10. So from our most recent report, marijuana use in the past year among sexual minority males was nearly twice as high as compared to straight males, which means essentially 40% of sexual minority males used marijuana in the past year. Sexual minority adults were at least as twice as likely as straight adults to have misused stimulants, which means uh, cocaine, methamphetamine, or prescription stimulants. Bisexual females were at least tw twice as likely as lesbian females and more than three times as likely as straight females to have misused opioids. We hear a lot about the opioid epidemic, but we don't always hear about its prevalence within the LGBTQI plus community. Um, I'm sure a lot of you will also not be surprised that gay males are 15 times more likely to have used inhalants in the past year. Almost one third of bisexual males, bisexual females, and gay males had a substance use disorder. So not just used or misused, but have a diagnosed substance use disorder in the past year. More than half, half, more than half of bisexual females had a mental illness. And bisexual males were about as three times as likely, and male, gay males were twice as likely as straight males to have serious thoughts of suicide. And the prevalence among bisexual females was six times higher than straight females in attempting suicide. So I think one of the um, key points of this data, other than um, you know, the clear prevalence among all of these conditions, among all the community, really did highlight for us the bisexual community, and we really have a dedication to do more to that specific community based on the specific statistics. Um, as I said, this is what we've collected so far, but I have really good news that this year, in 2023, the National Survey on Drug Use and Health did finally, I, my opinion, um, start collecting gender identity data among all the household um, survey respondents. <laughs> And we're no longer going to be what I would call scared um, to ask the sexual orientation or gender identity questions among the 12 to 18 year old respondents. <laughs> so service delivery is obviously key as well. Um, this year we have worked to include in all of our notices of funding opportunity announcements language about the need to support and affirm LGBTQI plus individuals. Um, and we have added language in certain uh, notices of funding opportunity where appropriate, language about specifically supporting survivors of SOGI or sexual orientation and gender identity change efforts. Most of you and, uh, know it as so-called conversion therapy. At SAMHSA, we call it SOGI change efforts because we all know that it doesn't convert anybody and it's not real therapy. Um, so for our... We've added language that uh, if you find an individual who survived SOGI change efforts, that trauma-informed care is a required activity, uh, as an allowable activity, and as well that if you find an LGBTQI plus youth, that uh, it's an allowable expense to provide family support and counseling. And then we were very excited uh, just last month to actually have a fully dedicated grant program to LGBTQI plus family support and counseling. Many of you may be familiar with Dr. Kaylin Ryan's family acceptance project model, as well as um, other CV, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy-based models like uh, firm caregiver. And so this grant program will allow more entities to be able to have SAMHSA grant funds to undertake those types of uh, interventions with LGBTQI plus youth and their families. Um, and then, um, I just want to thank, I know she's not here anymore, but um, Ms. Jean-Pierre, um, you may have heard her from the podium of the White House Press Secretary talk about 988 Press 3 option. So we launched in September of last year the Press 3 option, which is a specialized uh, service that anybody who calls 988 and presses 3, or if you're chatting or texting, you can fill out a pre uh, pretty like a uh, questionnaire and answer openly if you would like that uh, you uh, identify as an LGBTQI plus youth and you would like those specialized services. We know that this service is tremendously needed. It started, as I said, in the end of September, and we already know that 6% of all 988 calls 
14% of all chats and 17% of all text messages are getting routed to that LGBTQI plus specialized service. I also just want to say on specialized services, um, I want to thank Admiral Levine for going out to Club Q um, after the, the mass shooting there. We have provided a state emergency response grant to the state of Colorado to ensure that behavioral health and recovery supports are there for the survivors of the Club Q shooting as well as those impacted in the community. And Admiral Levine took um, a significant amount of time and attention to address those individuals. Um, now, next on May 1st, uh, you may have seen Secretary Becerra stand at this podium as uh, he kicked off May as Mental Health Month and the launch of FindSupport.gov. FindSupport.gov is a website where anybody can go who would like support for alcohol, drug, or mental health issues. And it really helps sort of you navigate through um, the system, which can also obviously be very confusing um, when you may be struggling with a behavioral health condition. Um, from the very, very beginning, this website, findsupport.gov, have had three stories of individuals in recovery, and one of them is Max, who identifies as non-binary and is, uh, thinks that they have uh, depression. So the website already takes you through Max's story in a way that talks about how a non-binary person can seek behavioral health care. But I'm also pleased to say that today, this morning, we just added a new link to Max's story that takes you to an FAQ specifically for LGBTQI plus individuals. You can click on the FAQ and find out how to find an LGBTQI plus specialized provider, what you should be looking for when that provider talks to you as an LGBTQI plus person, what type of therapy they should be gearing towards you. Um, it provides information on the harms related to SOGI change efforts and all the different uh, associations, medical associations, psychological associations, et cetera, that have condemned or rejected SOGI change efforts. And finally, I wanna draw your attention to a report released on uh, March 31st of this year in, con um, in conjunction with Transgender Day of Visibility, which is our Moving Beyond Change, of, excuse me, Moving Beyond Change Efforts report entitled Evidence and Action to Support and Affirm LGBTQI Plus Youth. Some of you may be familiar with our 2015 report, which was uh, focused on ending conversion therapy. We still use the term at the time. Um, but this is a follow-up to that report, which includes additional um, and updated consensus statements from expert panel and the field. Um, it draws attention to new and updated research on the actual harms that can take place to individuals who survived SOGI change efforts. And of course, provides actual uh, information about how to provide support and affirming care to LGBTQI plus individuals. It also includes a new policy section that talks about what schools, communities, and other leaders can do to support and affirm our LGBTQI plus youth. So thank you so much for having me here, and I'm looking forward to talking about how all these syndemics uh, intersect with each other. Great, thank you. <clears throat> So I think we have we have a minute for a question from me to the panelists, and I'll include myself in the panel. I'll put my CDC hat on when I answer it, and then um, we'll have I think time for like one one or two questions from the audience, if that's okay. So um, one of the challenges I think that um, sort of looking at the LGBTQ community is how we all like very much focus on the problems, and it's appropriate to focus on the problems, and so. I want to ask you all like how you think about supporting the joy and how the syndemic strategy can help support the joy of our community. Who wants to take that first? I'm happy to. Um, look, I think that there is so much to celebrate um, that doesn't in any way diminish the work that's ahead. Um, but uh, this administration, this president, this secretary have leaned in so far um, um, to all of us at agencies across the department to say what more can we do to support LGBTQ children and adults? What are the kinds of things that we can do um, that will mean make a meaningful difference in people's lives? How do we end discrimination? How do we support um, uh, people best? And I think that you know, looking at the kinds of things 
that we're talking about, making meaningful difference in how we do our grant making, making meaningful difference um, in how we build bridges between many of our programs on the ground um, so that there's no wrong door to accessing care, to getting prevention, to getting treatment services, making sure that we are building up people with lived experience to be part of the care solution. This is happening in community after community, partly with our, because of our dollars, mainly because of the community support. We are working really hard to try to bring what we know works to the community, um, and we're really grateful for all of your partnership and leadership in that work. Amazing, thank you. Um, so I would say, in addition, um, so one thing that brings me joy is all of those updates I was able to provide and all the progress that we are making. But uh, like Ms. Jean-Pierre, I have, uh, my daughter is actually just about to turn 10. And what really brings me joy and, and hope is that, um, you know, it's such a non thing to her, um, which really I think means um, that in the future there'll be a lot less harassment, bullying, discrimination, and stigma. So just to give a couple examples. Um, so I was picking her up from aftercare one day. I was like, oh, that person who checked you out, I haven't seen them before. You know, what's their name? And uh, she said, oh, their name's Cricket. And I was like, oh, that's an interesting name. And she says, yeah, you know, he's transgender. He was female, but now he identifies as male. And I was like, oh, okay, that's cool. Um, you know, and it's such a non-thing to her that this, you know, individual in her high school who, um, is transgender, or um, you know, most of her friends, like nobody, thankfully, granted we live in this area, you know, makes any big deal about the fact that she has two daddies. Um, or even the other day, she corrected me. I don't remember the whole story, but I said something like, and then he, blah, 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 and she's like, daddy, it could be female, it could be non-binary. I'm like, okay, she gets it, it's totally awesome. And I have total joy that this, um, you know, a younger generation, um, just thinking that way will lead to the less discrimination, stigma, harassment, and bullying, which we know will lead to less behavioral health problems. So I'm gonna put my CDC hat on and just really echo so much of what you heard, which is I think that for me, what I think is the most inspiring is that, that sort of thinking about ways that we can focus on the health of the population and use all the tools that may be specific to either mental health, substance user health, HIV, HIV prevention, how we can weave that together along with other things like housing to be able to deliver what people need <clears throat> and what they want as opposed to what we think they need and want. And so I think, I know from HRSA like every day and SAMHSA every day, we work so closely, like all the engagements that I've seen and just really seeing it actually change the way funding streams are developed and the way the work is developed, I think is really inspiring. I think as someone who is only three, two years, two and a half years old in the HHS system, um, really just seeing that dedication from the highest levels of leadership makes such a big difference. So I think that uh, that that we we use the process problems and we use those solutions to create better care for people and LGBTQA um, I plus one specifically. I was just going to add that you know the um, the structural barriers that sometimes exist in government contribute to the challenges and discrimination and weathering in communities on the ground so the better we do and the better this team is representative of how we're trying to do this and bring down those barriers, the more we can contribute to a world where there is less discrimination and mental health challenges and better access to services. Can I hear an amen? <laughs> it's amazing. Thank you. I, th I think we have time for one question from the audience. I wish we had time for more, but we're going to do some catch up to make sure that we have plenty of time and also preserve your break because breaks are important. Thank you, great seeing three friends up there. Hey guys, and ladies, uh, and people. <laughs> uh, <laughs> my question is, we talked about MPOX and people getting tested and that some had, were, had other STIs and some were infected with HIV. Did any people learn about other statuses as they came in to uh, be tested? And can you talk about that? So, so I, it's it's more anecdotal in terms of of who um, learned about their status at the time. But what's really inspiring is that that the organizations like the community health centers, like the Ryan White sites that actually do HIV testing as well, like really put all of that together in a package. So unfortunately, some of the people with the most severe outcomes learned about their HIV when they got diagnosed with their most severe outcome, but 
There are people who are in the mix who learned about their MPOX diagnosis and learned about their HIV much earlier and are now on antiretroviral therapy getting undetectable, which means that their disease won't transmit. Then also, there's a lot of them who got tested who were HIV negative, status is less important, and who got referred to PrEP. We have great models of folks who um, who literally found out they had MPOX and touched the system. And, and sometimes that system works. And when it does, it gives good care to people. So thanks for the question. And we need to be in a place where it doesn't take another virus to get those individuals connected to care and services, right? We need to be in a place where that is ubiquitous and easy to access and people find out um, um, as early as possible. Thanks for that question. We can take one more because everyone's so efficient. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Great panel. Um, question, Brian, for you, but this could be for anyone. What do you see as SAMHSA's role in meeting the needs for older LGBTQ adults who are facing mental health issues and loneliness at this time? Yeah, well, speaking of partnering, you know, certainly um, we work closely with the Administration for Community Living and the Administration on Aging. I actually was there for almost a year before coming uh, back to SAMHSA. So, I think you know it, it's a really important factor. Social isolation and loneliness, um, we know, is a tremendous issue, and the uh, the trauma of that generation that they faced, um, particularly gay men who have lived through the HIV epidemic, as um, Carol's talking about, their focus on HIV and older adults, their mental health is obviously important too. We know not only that they survived that, but the laws were quite discriminatory, and that support from family is really key to older adults and their mental health, but they weren't allowed to get married and so they don't have spouses, or they weren't allowed to have children to take care of them um, later in life. And so making sure they're connected to other types of family support or friend, uh, family in a much broader sense or, uh, or care is really, really important because those natural supports that sometimes exist for older adults and keep them um, you know, from getting to, the, to a true loneliness or social isolation position. Um, is much more difficult for that for the current older adult generation, um, and so you know we look to make sure that our um, 988 is um, geared towards older adults as well. That we um, make sure that trauma informed approaches uh, focus on older adults and, and many other areas. And with that, I think we'll thank you all for your questions, and we'll thank um, thank you Team HHS for a great session. Go team. Carol Bryan, thank you for joining, and we are right on time again. So thank you so much. Such a great and informative panel. Thank you, Demetrius. Thank you, Administrator Johnson. And thank you, Brian, for that conversation. I'll tell you that one of the hardest panels to decide who speaks on uh, was this one. Uh, because there's so much happening across the department that we could have spent the whole day talking about that. Uh, but again, thank you for the panelists who, who joined us, and there's much more that we're going to present throughout the day. Um, I have the distinct honor now of moving to our next conversation, which is a fireside chat on individual identity. Uh, we started today's this, uh, conversations on accomplishments because, as Demetrius asked, there's so much joy and so much uh, uh, accomplishments for us to celebrate. And I'm reminded of what uh, the White House press secretary said, which is always a danger trying to quote somebody of her caliber, but she said, no one should have to be brave just to be themselves. And so we're looking forward to, to this discussion. It will be moderated by Admiral Dr. Rachel Levine. We have Kelly Robinson, president of the Human Rights Campaign, HRC. And we have Imani Rupert Gordon, Executive Director, National Center for Lesbian Rights. Have a great panel. Please sit down. I knocked down the flag. It's terrible. <laughs> there we go. Well, good morning. Good morning. Is, is it the right? Is it in the right way now? There we go. I don't know if you can see it. it <laughs> it's wonderful to be here, and it's wonderful for HHS to host an in-person Pride event today with so many distinguished guests. 
And it was great to hear, from, of course, from Secretary Becerra and White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre earlier this morning. So thank you for that introduction. I am Admiral Rachel Levine, she, her pronouns, and I have the honor of being the Assistant Secretary for Health and the four-star Admiral for the United States Public Health Service Commission Corps. And to be the first openly transgender person in a Senate-confirmed federal <laughs> official. Person. Thank you, thank you so much. I know my appointment paves the way to national leadership that is more reflective of the people that we serve because representation absolutely matters. I am so delighted to moderate such a dynamic panel. Joining me today is Kelly Robertson, she, her pronouns, and she is the president of the Human Rights Campaign, the largest LGBTQI plus civil rights advocacy organization in the country. And Imani Rupert Gordon, she, her pronouns, and she is the executive director of the National Center for Lesbian Rights. So thank you so much for being here. To me, pride is hope, and pride is change. And as you heard, I have declared a summer of pride. And I am particularly hopeful this pride. It is an inflection point for our country. We need to work all summer, and then I'm going to declare an autumn of pride, so get ready. <laughs> to change things in the face of adversity, to create change and to catalyze change in the face of adversity. It's a chance to change the narrative on the misinformation and overt disinformation that we are seeing. It's an opportunity to educate the public and our administration gives me hope with our President, President Biden, Vice President Harris, Secretary Becerra and more. So now I'm going to sit down and we'll start our panel. Hey, Al, how you doing? Doing well. You good? Great. So I'm going to start by asking um, each of you, uh, what does pride mean to you? And specifically, what does pride mean to you this year? Imani. Thank you so much. It's such an honor to be here. Thank you. Um, just a big fan. <laughs> oh. um, so pride. Um, you know, as an LGBTQ person, I think um, we think about pride often. It's something that comes up. But, you know, in this moment, this year, what's coming up for me is that we talk about the anti-LGBTQ bills. Uh, right now we're looking at more than 650 anti-LGBTQ bills that have been introduced in 2023. And just to provide some context, in 2015, that number was just over 100. And so that's an alarming number. But when we say that, we do need to give some context so we know what we're, um, what we're talking about. But the other part here is um, I think we do a really good job of talking about why these bills are so scary, especially when the vast majority of them are really going to hurt trans young people. But I also think that it's imp important that we also think about how all of these bills are working together. And one of the things that I think about this Pride season is um, the don't say gay or trans bills and the attack on our education system. And that's standing out to me right now because just last, um, last year, we're, you know, um, after the Dobbs decision, we had an opportunity to see that over 50 years that there were, um, that we saw um, them chipping away at, um, at our rights to abortion and what that would look like for the LGBTQ community. Not that we're not obviously part of reproductive justice community, but what that would look like for us. And um, it would look like an attack on our education system. It would make it possible for second and third and fourth graders to be afraid to say who they are, to talk about their sexual orientation, their gender identity, to not quite know if they could say this or that or they could be this or that. And we have folks growing up in a time like that then if you're doing that when you're in second and third and fourth and fifth grade, what happens when you're 18? What happens when you're of voting age? Um, you know, among all the things that are happening, one of the things that these anti-LGBTQ laws are doing, they're making us self-censor ourselves. And I think that during this Pride season, I want us to be thinking about what is going to be happening next. Because um, this stuff, it's not, you know, we can see this coming and we've seen it before, but that's something we need to be paying attention to. And so this Pride season, I'm thinking a lot about how we can be thinking about what we're doing differently. Absolutely. Uh, actually, in the words uh, of, of Dimitri, it's a syndemic. We, we actually have a syndemic of misinformation and disinformation and a syndemic in terms of the, the uh, opposition that we're facing. Um, Kelly. Whew. Well, let me tell you this. I needed pride this year. Absolutely. Um, happy pride, everybody. Happy pride. Um, <laughs> 
And I needed it because of everything that Imani said. Like, I've traveled across the country and heard so many stories of families that feel like they're unsafe in their state and are thinking about what it means to send their kids to live with a different relative in another state for right. their safety, for their health, for their well-being, for them to live. I hear from black trans women every day as we face another deadly year for trans women, talk about what it means to leave the house and not know if you're gonna make it home again. The amount of fear that they are purposely perpetuating in our community is horrifying. And, it's, and I know that it's a strategy, that if they make us feel isolated, if they make us feel afraid, if they push us back into the closet, they're hoping that we will literally and figuratively cease from being. That's exactly right. So when I say I needed pride this year, I need it because I needed to see visibly and vocally millions of us out in the street being unafraid, being proud, being visible, being joyful in the way that we all deserve. And for me, this pride, I think one, it's about joy. And I heard somebody say joy in the last panel. My ears started to ring. Um, and I also think it's about joy as a strategy. Because when we lean into who we are authentically, when we are bold and brave in our full identities, we actually open room for building the kind of power that we need to transform the systems that have held us down. And especially as a black queer woman, we're part of a legacy of fighting for our freedom and embracing joy as a strategy every step of the way. So I'm leaning into that, this pride. I'm wearing bold colors, this pride, um, because we're not going to go away. We have always been here, we will continue to. And in this pride, it's about leaning into joy as that strategy of resistance and resilience. Absolutely. So uh, that's a good segue to my next question. How do your identities as black queer leaders inform your work for the LGBTQI plus health equity? Kelly, we'll start with you. Yeah, I've been thinking about this a lot, and I get to sit next to leaders like Imani, leaders like uh, Stacey Stevenson from Family Equality, like Mellingham, Melanie Willingham Jaggers from Glisten, and Kiara Johnson from the Task Force, and so many others. Like, black queer leaders are at the forefront right now, and it feels good. For me, the reason why it really matters, I feel like, as a black queer woman, um, part of the way that I build movement is about seeing myself as a futurist. Um, I think for me, uh, I'm actually, we're sitting here a couple years after my great aunt passed away a few years ago at the age of 102. Oh um, and my family, we were the first free black family in a town called Muscatine, Iowa. Uh, and when I was growing up, they told us the story a lot of how my great aunt in her life had said that the footsteps of people born into slavery. And what a powerful thing that is for her to have said the footsteps of people born into slavery two generations prior. And now I'm sitting up here with y'all at HHS <laughs> talking about how we transform systems for us. That's incredible. And you don't get there without being a futurist, without being able to see things that you may not experience in your lifetime, but believe that they are possible. And I think that's the opportunity and possibility of the leadership on this panel for us to vision a world beyond what we can even believe today. Uh, and I'm so excited to be a part of that, especially in community with people like you. Thank you. Imani? I always just love listening to you talk. This is just so inspiring. Um, but I, uh, I completely agree, but I think another thing that's important to say is that I only experience my queer identity from being a black woman. That is the only way that I know that it exists, so it has to impact everything that I think about. But that matters because we need folks with different perspectives in positions of power. That, because it does matter, a lot of times that's the first step, that's how programs happen, that's how things are rolled out. I remember once um, I was, um, I'm a social worker by training, and um, I was uh, doing a program, we learned of this, um, of this organization, and they were doing, they, they said everyone should have access to therapy, and so we are going to set aside some, um, some therapy hours so that everyone has access to them. And you know we're gonna make these um, very low barrier, but because we only have a limited number of, of, of spots, you know, we, we just need people to at least give us 48 hours notice, um, and, and then we'll hold these spots for them. And it sounds really great. But we lived in Chicago, and the folks that were needing the ther th therapy lived on the south side of Chicago. And for those that know, if you need, need to go from the south side of Chicago to the north side of Chicago, it's intentionally difficult to, to do. And so um, if you're taking public transportation, that can take two and a half hours. And if you think about taking two and a half hours there, two and a half hours back, the cost, you know, you think that, oh, it's just like, 
you know, get on the L. It costs three bucks. Um, that's not actually true. That's not actually true. And not that three dollars wouldn't be something that might keep folks away. But for some folks, that actually might be twenty-two dollars um, just to go to this one therapy session. Two hours there, two hours back, an hour in therapy. Um, we don't think about what it means to take off work to do this, on um, what childcare looks like to do this. And I mention all of this because even with the very best of intentions, that program didn't work out for the folks that it was meant to work out for. And that matters because if someone else had a different perspective, if someone was in that room, had been from the south side of Chicago, they could have said something about that. If someone had been in that room who had been um, a single mother or had, or had, or who had, their mother was a single mother, they would have known that this actually isn't something that would work out. And so bringing all of this back, when I say that um, who I am matters, it's because I have a different perspective. Just like every single person in this room has a different perspective, and we all need to be part of those solutions. The first time people understand that maybe a solution can work for them for maybe the first time is because they look up and maybe someone shares something. Because I know for some of us, we didn't see ourselves represented in a variety of ways. And so when solutions came up, we didn't know if they would work for us. Or often, we already knew that they didn't. Mm. And so for us, I think that matters for people. Just being able to see yourself, that is something that makes a difference. And so that's how it comes together for me. And as Kareen said, your identities are uh, uh, make you a superhero, right? Yeah. Your identities are your superpowers. Yeah. And so that makes you superheroes. You are superheroes. You all are superheroes. Yes. You know what? In fact, we're going to give out capes as you leave here because you all are superheroes. Um, at HHS, you know, uh, under Secretary Becerra's leadership, um, uh, health equity is fundamental to everything that we're doing. And, and LGBTQI plus health equity is pretty broad and includes many different topics for our many different identities, for our whole rainbow family. So what do you, it, what do you see as some of the greatest challenges that we face for LGBTQI plus health equity? Imani. Um, so, you know, in this moment, I think obviously we are all thinking about what is happening for trans young people, but trans people in general, um, getting the health care that, uh, that they need. And this is something that has been politicized because we know that every uh, major medical association has said that this is health care that is absolutely necessary. So this shouldn't even be a question that we're thinking about this. So that's something that comes up. You know, we're right at the anniversary of um, the Dobbs decision. And so we're thinking about reproductive um, justice and health care and health care that we all that we all deserve. You know, Kelly and I are both um, black women. And so when we think about, um, you know, we have a, a maternal uh, uh, moral, um, a mortality crisis, excuse me. And um, we know that that is a lot worse for black women. And so thinking about not having access to the, um, to the reproductive care we need, that disproportionately impacts some of us. And those are things that we're, we're thinking about as well. And, and so these are the things that come up a lot in, you know, when we talk about LGBTQ people. But I think something else that's really important is that often when people say, you know, what's affecting the LGBTQ community? What they're looking for is one single thing that is different for LGBTQ people than everything else. But typically things don't work like that for us. And the things that are hard for LGBTQ people are hard for everyone. But what we end up saying is that um, LGBTQ people don't get the health care they need because they're discriminated against um, in healthcare settings. And that's true, that is absolutely true. But the vast majority of LGBTQ people that aren't getting the health care they need aren't getting it because they don't have access to health care, because they don't have insurance, because they don't, because they don't have the economic power to get the health care they need. And so when we think about these things, I think that's something really important too, that it's it's our LGBTQ identity compounded on other things. So I think that's something that I I really think we need to pay attention to. It's not just what is affecting LGBTQ people singular like singularity Let's, I cannot speak today, but and it, it, it's not the only thing that's affecting LGBTQ people, but rather, how are the things compounded and making LGBTQ people experiences a lot different and a lot worse? Kelly? Yeah, I, I think that last piece that Imani said is so profound. 
um, thinking about the barriers that come between people and getting to the care that they need, want, and deserve. You know, um, one of the things that we talk about a lot, I mean, even just with, you know, folks in, in my community is trying to get access to mental health providers, right? right? Um, and not being able to find providers of color, providers that share their identity. Um, this is a challenge for folks, even when the resources are available to them. And you can put available in quotes depending on what availability looks like and means. Um, I mean, to me, when I zoom back, I mean, the, the challenges, the health challenges facing our community are so um, immense right now, it becomes hard to figure out how to tackle them. And I do think a lot of it comes back to systemically what it means to have bodily autonomy and for people to have the ability to make the decisions that are right for themselves and for their bodies and for their families, no matter where they live in this right. country, right? Um, oh, well, Absolutely. Sure. Uh, and you know, before coming to the human to the human rights campaign, I spent about um, 13 years at Planned Parenthood. So for me too, um, that Dobbs decision is so heavily weighing on on me and on our movement, and really on these ideas of bodily autonomy. And I think one of the things I still come back to is that even with Roe in place, abortion was a right in name only to too many people because of the systemic barriers that people experience, because of the lack of providers that were available, um, because of the lack of resources. So when we're thinking about health challenges, I do want to be thinking in that expansive sense. A couple of specific things that we're focusing on are, of course, one, access to gender-affirming care that every medical organization has deemed life-saving. Um, we're really focused on that and making sure that we're eliminating the fear and stigma that our opposition is seeking to create around um, a medically reviewed uh, process that, again, every medical organization supports. So dealing with the stigma there, I think, is incredibly important. Um, and talking about it and finding ways for us as allies to also talk about things like gender-affirming care that feel comfortable for us so that we're not silenced in the face of all of that critique and criticism and fear-mongering. Um, the second thing, I think, is HIV prevention. I'm so excited to be partners with HHS and all of that work. Uh, the science is there. We know that. Now the task is to eliminate the stigma and eliminate the disparities that we're still experiencing, especially for black and brown folks, especially for men who sleep with men. So a lot of work that's going on there. Um, and then the third piece um, that I also want to talk about as a public health crisis is gun violence. Right. The way that it is stealing our people um, my wife works at every time for gun safety, and the way that that is stealing our people, that is definitely a public health crisis, in my opinion, that we should address as one, Th especially the way it impacts our community. Absolutely. Thank you so much. <laughs> one, you know, there are so many different issues. One other topic that, uh, um, that I would point out is cancer. Um, is cancer screening, um, reproductive cancer screening for uh, lesbian and bisexual women, um, uh, anal cancer f uh, and other types of cancer, oral cancer for, um, for gay and bisexual men and other men who have sex with men. Um, and and that many of just says caused by HPV, human papillomavirus, for which I'll just point out that we have a very safe and effective vaccine for HPV. Uh, which has been maligned as a quote-unquote um, sex vaccine, but actually it's a cancer prevention vaccine. Um, what advice would you give to LGBTQI plus people who are going to take your positions in the future, you know, the, um, or our positions in the future in, in terms of health, whether at the local, state, or federal level? What advice would you give to our young people? Come do it, y'all. Um, <laughs> um, but you know, I, I think something that I do think is important is that often when we want positions that we, we feel like that's something that I want to do in the future and we think so highly of folks, so often what we do is try to emulate them. We try to say, how can I speak more like this person? How can I think more like this person? Um, how can I learn more about these issue areas because this person cares about these issue areas? But I think the magic that we bring is that we all have something about us. And so to be the best version of yourself is going to be the best version of yourself. And so I think that when you are thinking about this, to not try to be like us, you know, bring something entirely different. And I would say be yourself there, you know, bring your magic because that is what's gonna help everyone. That's what's, you know, we don't need, we don't need more people like us. We got this, you know, I'm a great Imani, best one ever. <laughs> <laughs> Best Kelly I know. Um, come and be you. Be you. And that's what our movement needs.
I love that. You are the best Imani ever. Um, I would say yes, be you and trust yourself. I think I spent so much of my career thinking, oh, there's got to be something I don't know. There's got to be, my gut's got to be off. Trust yourself because everything that you're bringing to the table is more than enough. And also don't wait. Don't think that this position is for you sometime down the road. Do it today because we need you in the movement right now. Um, and then what's been coming to my mind a lot, I think it's a quote by Picasso. I saw it at Home Goods, to be honest with you. I'm one of those <laughs> pillows. <laughs> they have good quotes, okay? Um, but it said something like, the only limit to what's possible is what you can imagine. And that just resonates with me, not only for a pillow that I now have in my bedroom, but, <laughs> but also for an ethos that we should take to life. The only thing that is limiting what's possible is what we can imagine to make real. Um, and our task is to be ourselves, lean into our truths, and imagine a world that's better than we can achieve today and go and fight for it. Well, that's why I've always been a, a love being a pediatrician, because our children are our future. Our children are our future. So uh, we have time for one more question. Uh, we've been talking about the importance of representation in leadership. And so what are your thoughts about the importance uh, for our community of representation in leadership, whether it's in government or in advocacy organizations or in business or wherever? It matters. I mean, look at these walls <laughs> that we're sitting in, especially this one wall over here. Wow. What a difference leadership huh. makes that this group of folks sitting on stage looks vastly different than that wall that I look at over there. <laughs> what a difference it makes. And I am so proud to be a part of this chapter of leadership, but I also know that my job is to make sure that there's w there, there is room for even more seats at our collective table. Um, so representation matters so much, and I also think that each of us has a responsibility to lift as we climb to create more room That's for exactly others. Right. Thank you. Imani? Um, I mean, same. I think representation is something that um, a lot of folks are able to take for granted, and that is by design. You know, we tell folks, hey, look, this is what we want you to see. You know, there's a, this story that I'm sure most folks have heard about. You know, before, we, before someone was able to run a mile in under four minutes, no one could. And then once someone could, then people could. You know, no one was able to split an atom until someone could. You know, and we say these sort of things. Once it's done, it puts it in our mind that that is possible. And everyone deserves that. Everyone deserves that. But some of us just don't get it. And not that we can't think big, because we know what that's like when you think something outside, like the kind of pride you have when you feel that. But think about where we would be if everyone felt like someone like them that had the experiences that they had we're already doing something. What would they think was possible? And so I think that's, that's incredible. And the last thing I want to say is that representation is important, but it's not everything. Mm. The idea is not just to put people in positions of power without giving them the proper training, without making sure they're ready. Too often people are saying, oh, you know, we want people to, to be represented here, but, but we're not doing it in the right ways. So you have folks with the most outstanding, bright futures put in positions that they're not ready for. And a lot of times, our reputations aren't as flexible from underrepresented identities. And when we're put in positions that we're not quite ready for, sometimes our failures there, will ne we, we never overcome those. And so that's something that we need to be thoughtful about. So representation is incredibly important, but it's not everything. We have to make sure that we're taking care and pre preparing all of our leaders. Yeah. Well, th thank you, Imani. Thank you, Kelly. That was absolutely great. So. You know, I hope this session and really the whole conference, the whole symposium, Pride Month, Summer of Pride, really leaves everyone here with, with a sense of hope, a sense for a better, healthier future for the LGBTQI plus community, but for everyone in America. Now, I've said many, many times that I am a positive and optimistic person, and I truly believe that working together, we can come out of these very challenging times stronger than ever. Uh, we have a very strong and resilient community, and we can work together to build a better future for our nation's health. With leaders like Kelly and Imani as partners, we can work to improve health equity for all LGBTQI plus individuals and everyone in our rainbow family. And I absolutely believe that we can succeed. Now, you know, I'm a product of the 60s and 70s, and so in the 60s and 70s, we would also often say peace and love. Peace and love. But I'm going to add to that. It's peace, love, and pride. So to everybody, peace, love, and pride. Thank you.
What an incredible panel. Uh, please join me in once again honoring our, our panelists today. All right, y'all, I need y'all to pay very close attention. The next thing that we do is gonna be very important. It's a break. <laughs> so we have 10 minutes. Uh, there are snacks, there's water, there's juice. The restrooms are, be uh, the gender neutral restrooms are behind me this, in this direction. Uh, yeah, I'll take that. Um, but please be back here in 10 minutes so we can continue the program. Thank you. You know, before going to break, um, I made a couple of announcements. And one of them is that we have gender neutral bathrooms in the back. And one of the things that someone said in the audience was, yeah, we fought for that. And I think is a, a fitting uh, lead up into our next panel, uh, which is your civil rights. We have, I have the honor of introducing Melanie Fontes Rayner, director of the HHS Office of Civil Rights. She'll be moderating a conversation today. We also have Arlie Christian, campaign strategist, Trans Justice American Civil Liberties Union, also known as ACLU. We have Harold Phillips, director, the White House Office of National AIDS Policy. And we have Casey Pick, director of law and policy for the Trevor Project. Have a great panel. Thank you. Um, so I was told to have a more organic panel, um, so work with us. Um, you guys are supposed to laugh, but um, okay. <laughs> this is not going to work. Um, so very, very privileged to be here. Um, someone told me this is a historic event for HHS, so really kudos to our Intergovernmental Affairs Office and Marvin's team for putting this on. Um, I think some of you know who I am, some of you don't know who I am. Um, so I'm Melanie Fontes and I run the Office for Civil Rights here at the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, our office has a national footprint. Um, so we have uh, representation in 11 different cities across the country, um, but we are a nationally facing office and we're um, very unique to other civil rights offices because we don't just enforce federal civil rights laws, we also enforce um, health information privacy laws. And I think, you know, having this unique seat at this moment in time really presents a unique opportunity for HHS as it looks at these issues, right? Because, sure, everybody knows federal civil rights laws um, continue to advance sexual orientation, gender identity, um, and including intersex characteristics in our recent 1557 Notice of Proposed Rulemaking. Um, but what people don't understand is how your medical information is being misused in this moment in time and what you can do to protect it. Um, and so, you know, our office is doing, we could spend here and talk a while, right? We have a lot of policy things in place. Everyone, I think, in this room probably submitted comments with respect to Section 1557 of the Affordable Care Act, which is non-discrimination health programs and activities. Um, we have a lot of work in that area. We put out guidance last year. Um, we've been um, halted by a judge in Texas with respect to that guidance to a certain extent. Um, so that is all out there. That is an area we spend a lot of time um, trying to advance and making sure we can do more in the space because you know, we really look to federal civil rights laws as this branches into these states where they may have governments that don't necessarily um, represent them or include them or think about them. Um, and I think, you know, we're seeing bans across the country, right? That's not a secret. Um, I think every time I give a speech on this now, the number of states that has a ban is growing. Um, the last I checked, I thought it was 19 states, um, and that continues to grow. And so our job becomes more and more important. Um, your jobs become more and more important. And being allies and being out front and speaking up is really, really, really important in this moment, right? Like I put up a pride flag at my house this year. I have never done that. Not because I didn't want to, but because I hope that if some kid is driving by or somebody, my neighbor sees it, they feel seen. And that's the importance of what we're doing here today and that's the importance of the work. But we talk a little bit about health information privacy. Um, I think folks think, oh, HIPAA covers all of my data. Um, well, you know, HIPAA doesn't cover all of the data that you have, right? It, it covers covered entities with respect to providers, health insurance companies, data clearing houses. And within that data, what we're seeing right now is that data being misused. Um, we have some, seen some cases in the news where we've seen people, um, so-called whistleblowers, go and leak patient information, appointment information, put it up online because, um, you know, they, they, they I, don't, I don't know the intent. I can assume what I think the intent is. 
but taking those steps and then making that data no longer private. Um, and so our office is investigating this. It's an area I think just really important to flag so you understand your rights. As care is being transitioned out in some of these states where bans are taking effect, understanding you know, HIPAA as a law gives you a right of access to your own information and data. You have that right. Um, in these situations where care is being tapered off or care is being restricted, it shouldn't be the case that you're no longer able to get your medical records. That is your right under law, and that is a very straightforward right. Um, so that's a, a lot of space we're, we're spending a lot of time on. Um, we also, we put out a guidance last year. Um, we also have a proposed rule. The guidance in and of itself, right, makes very clear that as you might be facing subpoenas or even just law enforcement coming into your building without a subpoena, that you're not required to hand over that, that information. That is a permissible disclosure, meaning it's, it's permitted under the regulatory framework, but it is not required. Um, and making sure that folks understand that because, you know, HIPAA applies to everybody in the room, right? So it's small, medium, large size providers. You might not have a privacy officer. You might not have a law firm on retainer. Making sure that folks understand that. Um, we also have a proposed rule, right, that is going to take a step further than that and prohibit um, disclosures, use and disclosures of data with respect to certain um, health care with respect to reproductive health. So I say all this is that we are a small office. You are all a really important partners for us to have a platform to make sure people understand the law, people understand their rights, um, and that people understand there, there is a place here at the Department of Health and Human Services that, that enforces those laws. And so as, as you see or hear stories of, you know, a pharmacy just won't fill scripts um, a pharmacy, you know, a lab stopped doing um, lab orders for certain populations. My doctor, even though the law hasn't taken effect in my state, is starting to taper off. Like these are real stories we're hearing, right, from parents and kids across the country um, and advocates. And so making sure you understand you can file a complaint with the Office for Civil Rights. Um, you know, we don't, it may not always look like we're doing a lot because we don't always comment or even talk about pending investigations, but, but we are. Um, and so making sure that you have that information. Um, I think it's, it's, it's hhs.gov backslash OCR backslash complaint. Um, and, and in addition, there, there's a bunch of pages with respect to HIPAA information on your rights and things like that. So I think if you take one thing away from here today, that would be the thing I'd ask that you take. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over um, here so you can get to the next. Thank you so much. It is such an honor to be here. Uh, my name is Arlie Christian. I'm a campaign strategist at the American Civil Liberties Union. Um, and today has just been an incredible gathering for Pride. So I'm really, really excited and energized by all the speakers, excited by all the work that everyone in this room is doing. Um, and I wanted to you know, just start off giving a little more color to some of the, um, the moment that we're in, the attacks that we're under, you know, the, the healthcare bans that have been enacted that we've heard so much about, um, but then talk a little bit about how did we get to this moment? Um, and just a little bit about what's giving me a lot of hope in this moment, um, because it is a difficult one, as we've been hearing for the community. Um, you know, we've heard a lot, you know, from January until now, until this moment, about the 500, 600, 650, depending on how you count them, anti-LGBTQ bills, right? Um, and I wanted to really remind us that for each of those bills, those 500, 600, 650 bills, we have had hearings across this country, right? And we've had hearings where trans folks, where their doctors, where their teachers, where their parents, their families are coming and standing in front of lawmakers and saying, please, please don't take away my care, please don't take away my rights, um, right? And I'll bring a couple of them to mind for us, right? We had um, Brandon, the dad from Missouri. I don't know if folks caught Brandon's video. Uh, it went a little viral, because um, Brandon is this uh, regular dad in Missouri who sat in front of his lawmakers and really, I would say, so patiently and so lovingly explained for them why, uh, or explained for them really his journey on accepting his transgender daughter, which is just so important for people to understand, right? Um, we heard from Cass, who is a 15-year-old trans girl in Ohio, and her mom, um, and her mom get, got up and testified in front of Ohio legislature, and her mom really got teary as she pleaded with these lawmakers please don't send us back to where we were before we were able to access gender-affirming care. So really <laughs> incredible families across the country speaking up. And I will say when we're thinking about this moment, we have to think about the trauma that occurred in these 500, 600 plus hearings, because many of these bills had multiple hearings, right? Um, that our folks and families across the country has stood up and pleaded with their lawmakers. 
So um, just a, a great trauma for our family, for our community, for all of us to really be holding. Um, as you've said, it, has, it got worse from there, right? We did have um, many states pass anti-LGBTQ bills. We're, I'm counting 20 right now for states that have passed um, health care bans. That's if you count the, the surgery only ban. And, you know, these bans um, are, you know, these attacks are not just happening on the state level now. And I think this is something this room needs to be so aware of, right? Um, our current biggest federal threat for, for gender affirming care is through the appropriations process. Um, we've seen already multiple riders that are trying to restrict our funding for gender affirming care and particularly for our most vulnerable communities, right? For military and veterans, for folks in homeland security detention, for our children's hospitals. So this is something that I want each of you, and I'm going to get to my next page. <laughs> Thank you. Um, this is something that like particularly all of us need to be so vigilant and make sure that not a single attack on, L on LGBTQ people happens on the federal level through our appropriations process. This really could be like the trans equivalent of the Hyde Amendment, right? Which has blocked Medicaid and other federal programs from ensuring abortions are accessible to our most vulnerable. So please, please, please watch out. Um, but I think all of this kind of gives us the picture of the full crisis mode that we're in as a community. Um, we are, as you've heard from so many of our other leaders, we're hearing from families across the country that are moving states, that are figuring out how to cross state lines to get care. Um, I'm thinking of Kai, our young trans leader from um, Texas, who stole many of our hearts. Um, she's 11 years old, I believe. She's been at the state house, right, since she was six, five or six. Um, and her family last year decided to leave the state um, because they were not safe. Um, so many other families are telling this story, and for each family that's moving, right, we have uh, many other families who don't have that option. We're seeing adults move too. Um, I'm thinking of the story of Eli and Lucas, who are two trans men in Florida, um, whose care was abruptly cut off, right, when their clinic stopped providing gender affirming care. Um, and so many other trans adults in Florida are facing that difficult decision. Um, and as, as you talked about, Director, you know, we're seeing hospitals shutting down care. We're seeing doctors who are being told they should not provide gender affirming care, sometimes because of the laws that are passing, but sometimes just because of that chilling effect of the fear and misinformation and attacks that are out there. Um, and just a moment, because I've asked myself this question so many times, like how did we get to this moment, right? Um, and I'll note for us, you know, Arkansas was the first state to pass a, a ban on health care for, for, for trans folks. That was 2021. That was less than three years ago, right? And now we're at our 20 states with bans. So I was like, did I miss a study that came out that disproved this care? Did I miss some information that changed the game? And the spoiler alert is, nope, I didn't miss anything, right? So this is really, this is a politically construed fight that we are fighting. And it is not based on science, and it's not based on fact, and it's not based on health. And it's really important for us to remember that um, as we go through. Um, and we've just seen, we've seen our opposition um, move from issue to issue. You know, when we won marriage in 2015, we saw a real shift in attacks on trans folks coming after that. Um, and we've seen our number of bills grow year to year. Um, so, so that's how we got to this moment. So, so don't forget, you know, I think sometimes we scratch our heads and be like, why is this happening? Um, but I wanted to really highlight before I, before I pass it on to our next speaker, just what's bringing me hope in this very, very difficult moment, right? So we talked about the Arkansas bill that passed in 2021. Just last week, we won our lawsuit in Arkansas. Uh, striking down the healthcare ban is unconstitutional. Really big win for our community. So that is absolutely giving me hope. I hope it is giving you all of you, all of you hope. Um, you know, the judge looked at all the information in that case and just saw an overwhelming body of evidence about the effectiveness of gender affirming care, about years of medical research, about best practices, um, and the harm that's caused to real families when this care is taken away. Um, and I'll really give a shout out to our plaintiffs in that case. There's four incredible trans youth in Arkansas and their families who have just stood up so bravely and talked about their lives and talked about the care they need. Uh, we've also had some really brave doctors, right, who would have been criminalized under this law um, who stood up in this lawsuit. 
Um, you know, the judge also saw that, like, when we look at how this bill was passed and what it says, it was specifically targeting treatments for gender transition, and these are treatments that, when used for non-transgender people, are perfectly acceptable, and so recognize the discriminatory nature of the law, recognize that there was no evidence that it was harmful, that it was, um, you know, not studied, etc. So. It really gives me hope because when we take away the fear mongering, the politics, um, we see the misinformation that has been flooding us. We see the truth is really clear, right? Um, and that Arkansas judge is not alone. Um, we have we have healthcare bans in Alabama and Florida and Indiana that are blocked by preliminary injunction. So those judges have looked at those bans and said, you know what, this is going to cause harm if we allow this to be enacted. So. I, you know, these, these cases um, and this progression is really giving me hope that we're going to get through all of the misinformation, all of the hatred um, that, that has been thrown at us um, and get to, you know, get to a better place. There so. was a, oh, okay, I don't know, um, <laughs> sorry. There was a line in the Arkansas, uh, is it Arkansas? There was a line in the Arkansas decision that talked about the vitriol on the one side and the, anim the, the animus. And on the other side, it talked about parents and that parents are just like their animus was love, <laughs> like love, love your kids, right? And I think that's like so important. Harold? Okay. Well, hello everyone. I'm Harold Phillips. I am the director for the White House Office of National AIDS Policy. Um, happy to be with you and part, part of the panel as well. Uh, and happy Pride Month. Um, I also want to thank the uh, HHS Summit organizers uh, because I've been in the HHS family for a number of years. Um, I don't know, it's 17 or 18 years of public service. They stopped giving pins, so I can't <laughs> keep track of the numbers anymore. Um, but um, I wanted to say a couple of, of things, um, both as director of the Office of National AIDS Policy and as a black gay man living with HIV who is virally suppressed and over the age of 50. Um, there you go. I think, you know, as we talk about representation and what it means and sort of showing up in that space, sometimes there are days when I go to work and, and recognize and have to stop and acknowledge that just going to work is an act of defiance. By all means and by others in society, I shouldn't be where I am. I shouldn't be in this place. I shouldn't be that voice at the table who's bringing that lived experience, who's thinking about um, my LGBTQ brothers and sisters and HIV and what it means for HIV, STIs, MPOX, the whole syndemic, mental and behavioral health, uh, housing, all of that, housing insecurity, our civil rights being violated. What does all that mean in the context of sort of the HIV space? And so holding space at, that ta at those tables is an act of defiance very often in, that sort of in those rooms. Also, the thing that Lee wanted me to sort of make sure that I talked about is, is sort of that journey. There have been for years times when I was the only one in that room and the only one holding that space. So as we talk about and talk with those who are younger and coming up, and I think the last panel said it, come on, we need you. Because those of us that are over 50 are awfully tired. Um, and, so, and, and so we're holding chairs for you and, and so please definitely, we want you to take them uh, and join us in this uh, as we sort of come to the sunset of whatever that is. Whenever I get that pin that tells me it's time to sunset, I will do that. Um, our national HIV AIDS strategy, and in, in thinking about civil rights, one of the moments that I was most proud about is the fact that, well, fearful and proud about. So as a black gay man living with HIV, there are about 30 states that still have HIV criminalization laws on the books. And although I am virally suppressed and cannot transmit HIV, those laws do not follow the science or the data and criminalize and harm people living with HIV. And in many cases and in many states, it's black and Latinx individuals, it is women, it is sex workers. 
So those on the edges of society are being targeted by these laws that are impacting their lives with criminal penalties, fines, being placed on sex registries. And to think that as the White House Director of National AIDS Policy, who is virally suppressed, those laws could impact me as well. So one of my most proud moments was when the release of the National HIV AIDS Strategy took place and President Biden talked about, and he went off script, which is often scary for some of us. <laughs> um, he talked about HIV criminalization in the speech that we had worked with the speechwriters and prepared, but he went off script and talked about the fact that at that point in time, we're in 2021, and that these laws need to follow the science, and that we needed to get on board with the fact that HIV is not even transmitted in many of these cases that involve spitting or biting on someone. And so it was one of those moments where I felt like, whew, he did great, he went off script, he spoke from the heart. And then a couple months later, I met a guy from Detroit who had been a victim of these laws. And he said he watched that speech from the East Room and he cried in his living room because for the first time, he felt like the President of the United States understood and got it. That's the importance of representation. That's the importance of doing the work and really trying to make a difference uh, as we move forward. A couple of things I also want to point out, because Melanie talked a lot about HHS and the work that is being done uh, and how HHS is moving forward. But as part of the work of the National HIV AIDS Strategy, we have the ability to bring in our other departments and our other programs within this work. And a couple of things that I want to point out, um, you know, in addition to the incredible work that your very small team is doing uh, and, and sort of doing this huge heavy lift, we also have others such as the Department of Housing and Urban Development, which is also involved in ensuring LGBTQ plus rights and individuals that are aware of their rights, especially under the Fair Housing Act and the Equal Employment Access Rule, which requires that eligibility determinations for housing assisted by HUD or subject to a mortgage insured by HUD are made regardless of actual or perceived gender identity and sexual orientation and marital status. Their Office of Fair Housing is involved in this work. Those who need to file a complaint or, or know others that need to file complaints can do so online, as well as their 800 number, which is also uh, on the website as well. Housing is the number one indicator of someone's health status and an influencer of their health status. So those who are unstably housed, at risk for housing and instability, all face an uphill climb. And so someone being discriminated against because of their sexual orientation or gender identity, the Office of Fair Housing is our friend uh, in that work as well. We continue to work with our partners uh, and at ONAP in the private sector as well to do a lot of work around both discrimination, stigma around HIV, LGBTQ uh, orientation as well. We have uh, put together a U.S. business coalition to end HIV, and many of our sort of big name private sector partners are all a part of this, and so they're also doing the work too. Um, tomorrow is National HIV Testing Day, so there are lots of resources and materials that are going out and targeting the community. The other thing that I will say that uh, we are working really hard to do is to improve access to PrEP. Uh, and the President has talked about this uh, as a uh, proposal in the budget, but also looking at those groups that are disproportionately impacted, not necessarily getting access. So how do we improve access? We also have at CMS our partners that are looking at um, the national coverage determination for those who are on Medicare and PrEP access. So there's a lot of different moving parts as we sort of look at this whole landscape and also trying to address stigma and discrimination in the way it gets in the way of our HIV goals. Thank you. <laughs> Harold, I, I, uh, I don't want to play favorites on the panel, but you're kind of like a celebrity. <laughs> oh, see? I wonder. Um, I think it's it's the eight, it's probably the 17 or 18 years in government. That's what it is. Or just you, right? Uh, Casey? Thank you so much for having me here today. I am so honored to be in this room. 
I actually look out into the crowd today and found myself thinking about, well, why exactly am I on this stage when there are so many advocates, folks out in this crowd who have been either working for decades to advance LGBTQ civil rights or who are the younger voices, the voices of people of color who are bringing those new perspectives that we need. And the answer that I have that I can offer is that I represent the Trevor Project. And <laughs> thank you. I have a few slides here that I hope will uh, show up on that. If somebody could pass me the remote. But the reason why it matters that the Trevor Project is on this stage right now is because as we look to these challenges to our civil rights, the reality is civil rights protections are suicide prevention for our community. Let's see. And at the Trevor Project, that is our mission. Our mission is to end suicide for LGBTQ young people. We have said for years that it is urgent, and it has never been more urgent than it is now. A little bit about what we do is that for 25 years, we have been who LGBTQ youth in crisis call, text, or chat at any hour of the day, any day of the year when they find themselves in crisis, when they feel alone, when they're thinking about hurting themselves, when they're thinking about killing themselves, when they just need for once that day to hear somebody use the correct pronoun for them. And so we have been hearing from these young people for all of that time. And we hear in so many ways. We, in addition to our crisis services and our social media website, Trevor Space, where young people talk to each other about what they're experiencing, their fears, their hopes, their joys. We provide a platform where they can support each other, which is so critical right now. We also do a lot of research. I know that there are folks in this room who have made use of our annual national surveys, our state-based studies, our research briefs. And that's another great way that we hear from tens of thousands of LGBTQ young people each year answering so many questions about what is going on that is relevant to their mental health, their physical health, their lived experiences and daily lives. We try to share what we hear through public education and through the advocacy team, which I'm proud to be a part of. I view all of the legislation that we're looking at, every bit of law and policy out there, through the lens of how it affects the mental health of LGBTQ young people. And I can tell you that right now, it's really, really hard. Here's that national survey, the most recent one, lets us know some vital data. Like in the last year, 41% of LGBTQ youth seriously considered attempting suicide. That number is higher for our trans and non-binary youth. It is likewise higher for youth of color. We know additional data relevant to this room that of the 60% or so of young people who tell us that they want access to mental health support, more than half aren't getting it. So there are so many barriers that we see to the kind of care that has never been more necessary. But we also know information about what makes a young person feel safe and accepted. Here's a little bit more information about the access to mental health care that our young people are seeking and the reasons they tell us why they're not getting it. And some of that is common, all too common, for anybody in our society. The simple cost, the existing stigma about receiving mental health care. Some of it is specific to our communities the fear of not being taken seriously because of their identity. Young people who are being denied access to mental health care because their parents disapprove and are afraid of what might be heard or said. And not on this list, but particularly relevant to the advocacy work we're seeing, some LGBTQ young people are not seeking out mental health support because they're afraid that if they do, they'll be met with a conversion therapist or somebody who will try to change them. And when we're in a climate where there are laws passing, that are prohibiting people from providing affirming care, best practice care, those odds get higher and our young people get more scared. So to speak a little bit directly to the impacts of these anti-LGBTQ policies and the debates that are surrounding them. I actually spoke recently to the leader of our crisis service counselors 
and was asking about data of, well, are we hearing from young people on the lines? I know what we're seeing in polling. I know what we're seeing in our annual survey. But they were able to tell me that since March, hundreds of the contacts that have reached out to our crisis services have explicitly mentioned anti-LGBTQ legislation in the course of the call. Hundreds may not sound like much, but we don't explicitly ask about these sorts of things. And can you imagine what it takes for a 15-year-old young person to mention a piece of state legislation by bill number? That's what I think about. I think about what I hear when I am privileged to travel the country. I'm one of those folks who testifies against these bills. I talk about the reality that 86% of trans and non-binary youth have told us that these bills have negatively affected their mental health. 55% say very negatively have affected their mental health. I say that to the lawmakers, but I also listen in hallways to the trans and non-binary young people themselves, to their parents, to their families, and they are tired. They feel alone, they feel exhausted, they are looking for belonging. And when I listen through that suicide prevention lens, I hear red flags. And that's part of what is concerning to me about these bills. Looking even more broadly than the access to the life-saving medical care that we know is gender-affirming care, I think about the overarching theme of these various different kinds of bills, whether it be so-called don't say gay or trans laws that are taking away schools as a safe and affirming space, taking away school counselors, taking away the ability to learn in school health classes about your identity, or if it's something like a sports ban, where I know that for myself, in high school for me, when I came out of the closet, was kicked out, found the doors locked behind me, it was my volleyball coach who saved my life. And being able to be on that team gave me a reason to get up and go to school, when otherwise I didn't know where I was gonna go. So these, all of these bills, the ones that threaten to out young people, the ones that say, you know what, don't use that kid's pronouns, you don't have to, or even you may not, what all of these things do is they shrink these numbers of safe and affirming spaces available to our LGBTQ youth. And safe and affirming spaces, more than that, safe and affirming adults in communities are suicide prevention. So that is the impact of what we're starting to see here. I wanted to actually show a map of where at the Trevor Project we track about 650 anti-LGBTQ bills that were introduced this year. Uh, my colleague Kate Smith is in the crowd today. Many of you know her, know her and have worked with them. They are the ones who track these bills and create these maps. And on one side, you get to see where the bills have been introduced. This is important to me because I want you all to know this is a national phenomenon. This is not one region, this is not a few states. This debate is happening everywhere. And I also wanted to let you know where these bills have passed, to know that that's where you were seeing that direct impact. But it isn't just the passage. The passage of these bills is terrible. The direct health impact of these bills is immeasurable. But the simple fact of the constant debate is something that wears on our young people. And that looks like coming home and seeing it on the 24-hour news service, where once again, LGBTQ people are being demonized. Words like groomer being thrown around. Uh, it looks like the family holiday dinner where you can't escape it. It looks like being at school and having your bullies emboldened. That's what it looks like to have all of this happening in the debate happening constantly. That said, I will say the fact that we have defeated about 90% of these bills matters. It matters when these young people see us standing up for them. Thank you. It matters when they see a governor veto a bill. Even if that veto is overridden, it still matters that somebody spoke up and stood up. And when we talk today about representation mattering, representation matters, that same kid who's calling out a bill by bill number pays attention to the ones who are standing up for him, her, or them. This is just a little bit more. The precise data on what we've seen, one in three young people telling us that their health, mental health is poor most of the time or always. Some of the concrete evidence of what young people are telling us their experience is because of these bills. That increase in cyberbullying and online harassment, which is why it is so important that we have safe and affirming online spaces for our youth to find belonging. 
the disruption in family relationships when you just can't talk to that person one more time and hear them not use the right pronoun. But particularly relevant to this room, the 29% of young people who tell us they didn't feel safe going to the doctor or hospital when they were sick or injured. Not even about seeking out gender affirming care, but just because of their fear of what's going on in the health industry right now. And whether or not they will find safety there when the laws are saying they can't. Trying to move a little bit more quickly through this, especially because in this room we know just how important access especially to gender affirming care is. That it is life saving and that we really don't want to see treatment interruptions. Anybody who's been on any kind of medication knows the importance of doing so consistently and having a stable relationship with your medical provider if you at all can. We know that our young people are very aware of the threats not only to themselves but to their families, to their doctors, to people they care about. Too often young people tell me they feel guilty about being the cause of all of this disruption to the people around them's lives. They are taking on and carrying too much that they should not have to muscle through, as was mentioned. And again, the data and the evidence is on our side. Um, based on Trevor's, na Trevor's data, we know that gender-affirming hormone therapy is associated with nearly 40% lower odds of recent depression and of a past year suicide attempt. When I say that this is a matter of life and death and that's how critical it is, this is what we're talking about. That said, I don't want to end this without calling out some of the things that we can do, some of the things that are empowering, some of the things that give a little bit of hope. We know that protecting affirming communities matters. We know that getting high social support from family and friends, things that no law can take away, matters. And we know what young people themselves tell us bring them, brings them joy. I love this slide, because this is where they tell us that they find support, what keeps them going. And it includes everything from drag shows to faith and spirituality, to queer role models and so much more. Yeah, I love the cameras coming out for this one. <laughs> and of course, that last point, every presentation I give, having at least one accepting adult in an LGBTQ young person's life can reduce the risk of a suicide attempt by 40%. No matter what the law says, no matter what it is, we can be that one adult. Thank you. So I, I use that stat all the time. When I was a counselor of the secretary, I would put it in the secretary's remarks all the time because I, to me, that's where, the, that's where the conversation should end, right? Period, done. Okay, it's healthcare, we're good, moving on. Um, but it doesn't. And so I think, you know, you, you covered a lot in your slides. And, you know, I, I think it's not just youth too, right? It's adults. Um, I was at a round table last week um, for Pride in St. Louis where um, at least one, but possibly two people mentioned calling 988. These are advocates who, like, like you, are going to state legislatures. They're talking to people like me. They're, you know, they're working with families. And they had reported in multiple times reaching out to 988 and how that was helpful, but how, you know, to your point, they're tired um, and they need this support. And so I guess let's just start there. And your slide indicated community is a really important place to start. So I'm in the federal government. Harold is in the federal government. What, what can the federal government do, whether it's here at HHS, um, you know, it's across the U.S. government, um, what, what can we do to sort of support that community and to provide tools so that we can help community? Understanding that there, there, you know, there are sometimes limitations on things that we can do, but like, what are things we can do within that space to try to help support that community and, and the transparency within the federal government? Absolutely. Uh, first thing that comes to mind, and I'm grateful for the start that has been made on this, listening to these advocates on the ground on what we say that we need. Uh, one thing that I think was actually a really concrete response to that that I'm appreciative to the federal government for is we've been talking a lot this pride season about the physical threats of violence that our community experiences. Um, as individuals and when we try to gather, when we try to have pride festivals, go to drag shows, those places where we find joy and rejuvenate ourselves. Uh, something that the federal government has recently done was release um, a set of guidelines and support tools on how to safety plan this. Because I, honestly, I have gotten tired from hearing state advocates tell me we want to do pride because we think the community needs it this year, but we don't know how to protect ourselves from the Proud Boys and things like that. So really, every aspect of government looking into what is within your jurisdiction, what is within your power. 
it matters for us to hear you say you've got our backs, but it matters so much more to see it. Yeah, that's so powerful and such a such a strong question. You know, I think as I think about what I want the federal government to do and really our, our country, our community to do, is remember that this issue is is not just about trans people. It's it's not just about trans kids, right? We all have to take on the issue of this of our freedoms as all of our freedoms, right? I will point out, remind us all, every single person in here has a gender identity, right? And we want to be able to express it freely. Um, this, you know, the freedoms of um, being able to access the care we need, the freedoms of being able to control our own bodies, to make decisions about our own lives, this affects every single one of us. And I, I say that because I think it's, it's very important as we're doing this work, the incredible work that's going on in the federal government across the country, in advocacy organizations, in, in um, houses, we have to remember that we're all intertwined. And the more we can connect each of our issues and the more we can say the world we want to live in is a world where there are not attacks on our access to care and there are not attacks on our freedoms to be ourselves. And we all can have the opportunities we need and we all respect and give opportunities, you know, uh, regardless of our racial backgrounds, our gender identities, et cetera. Um, it, and that we all have the right to, you know, vote <laughs> um, and participate in this democracy in, in equal ways. I mean, each of these issues are, are connected. So when I think about the, wor the great work that the um, government is doing, I, you know, I think about how we're all intertwined. Um, you know, I'll say very specifically, just since you're asking what can we do now, let's, let's pay attention to, to the, the federal process, what's happening in appropriations right now. Let's not let any of these attacks um, on access to gender affirming care and funding go through. That's something that we can all really work together on. Um, and then, you know, I think you talked a little bit about this. How can we protect not just our trans youth in this moment, but our medical professionals? We have medical professionals across the country who are under attack who are afraid to practice best practice care, and we need to do what we can as a, as a federal government to make sure that they are protected, that they understand their legal rights, and that they have the funding and the support and the clinics to keep providing this life-saving care. So. Harold, you talked a bit about, um, oh, snaps. <laughs> Um, Harold, you talked a bit, you talked a lot about um, your, your career with respect to HIV, and we know that HIV status, um, and whether you've had it or not, or um, you can, is a civil rights. Um, and, and in fact, the only time HHS has defunded an organization was when a provider refused to provide care to an individual in HIV status. Can you talk a little bit more about um, how that connects to this issue and how people sort of see the, the, the nexus of rights in the LGBTQI community? Um, and I know specifically, right, we're seeing attacks on PrEP right, and in the courts, and we're seeing um, the coverage being um, threatened for the first time, right? Like, with well, the ACA's been the law for how many years? 13 years, right? We're seeing the coverage now being threatened in court. And so can you just talk a little bit about that and the impact of the community and, and your work in the space? Yeah, thanks. And I think that this, my response, hopefully, you know, you can see the connections between all of this. One of the reasons why I feel like I've been involved and in working in HIV for so long is that HIV connects to so many different issues. So not only gay rights, but women's rights and reproductive health. Um, now we're dealing with age, issues of aging and you know what does it mean to grow old in America, which sucks and it doubly sucks for people living with HIV. Um, and so, uh, and, and then of course race issues and youth issues. And so that whole intersection I think allows us to be able to think differently and create and form lots of different partnerships and collaborations. One of the things that I think is, is, is so insidious about this time that we're living in is that there seems that there's a lot that is being designed to try and divide us. Um, but I feel like if we come together, like last week, I was in Memphis at a conference speaking about LGBTQ youth suicide. And it was a conference that was put on by black church ministers in Memphis. And sort of it, suicide in the black church was the theme of the conference. And yet, I, so I relied a lot on the Trevor Project's data, and also, which is why I raised my hand. But 
it was an opportunity to really talk to black faith leaders about LGBTQ youth issues, suicide, HIV, and, and really sort of doing that work, I think, in a real intersectional way and thinking about what are the other issues at play in the South. And so it's, it's for me, being able to be able to touch all of those issues and be involved and to try to push the rocks up the hill and, and work with others within those spaces has been a real opportunity to be able to respond to the current challenges that we have. And I think that's sort of the intersection and when we talk about sort of the syndemic and we talk about all of these issues and how they impact our communities, we need to think broadly about our communities and our coalitions. And one of the things that the federal government can do is create additional spaces where we all can come together, learn from one another, and collaborate. Um, it would, it, so I think it'd be helpful also to think about, you know, um, the last panel talked a little bit about um, Roe falling, right? And how that has energized and also, you know, m m restricted rights and made, made rights marginal. Um, and so I guess I'm just curious for the whole panel, if we could just talk a little bit about um, th that momentum, that, right? Like we've seen, right? Like state houses start to move in, in opposite of that the Supreme Court, I even in very states where the government may not necessarily um, be aligned. Um, and so we've seen like a lot of work across the country um, by advocates and others to try to reinstate these rights. And, and I guess I just wonder, I, I often think about abortion rights when I think about gender, not because they're the same, but because it's, it, I believe, right? Like, and this is just my, this is my personal view, right? That we will follow a similar trajectory. We're already seeing it with the Hyde like amendments. We're already seeing it with the bans. We're just seeing it at a rapid pace, right? And the, I think the difference here being that the population is also a bunch, a bunch of kids, right? And, and adults, but kids. So I guess I'm just curious, what can we learn from that trajectory? How are the groups working across all sort of civil rights organizations? And, and how can we use this sort of moment where really, I mean, and the dissent said it itself, right? Like really all, all rights are on the, the table. Um, and so you really don't have that security that you necessarily will have a right that maybe somebody else disagrees with you might have tomorrow. And so how can we use that moment to motivate people and to activate, um, you know, the fight back? Happy to, sure, happy to start us <laughs> off. Yeah, I mean, I think there is such um, uh, an incredible linkage between um, what's happening with, with our reproductive rights um, and our access to care for, for trans folks. And I'll say, I mean, first, these, these two um, movements are inextricably linked, right? And we have to understand that these are the same fight. You know, this is a fight for our ability to make choices about ourselves, as I was just saying, choices about our bodies, have our freedom to um, be, be in control of when we decide to be parents, when we start families, and who we are, right? Um, and, you know, I think the moment um, that we're in where, you know, we had the fall of, of Roe v. Wade and we have uh, extremist politicians really um, across the country who are pushing restrictions on our access to abortion care. Um, we're seeing those same politicians who are pushing restrictions on our access to gender affirming care. Um, but I will say we're in slightly different moments um, in our in these movements, these parallel connected movements, um, and in um, in the reproductive rights movement. You know, we've seen in so much of the polling that so many Americans do understand and want the right to be able to control their bodies and decide when they want to be parents and not be forced into pregnancies. We do have such a strong, um, you know, people understand the issue and, and people, you know, there's a, there's a lot of, um, we're seeing a lot of backlash against extremist politicians, Her right? Harold, you had yeah. talked a little bit, um, you had talked a little bit about businesses getting involved in the HIV work and I'm just curious, do you see a similar space in the t gender affirming care, reproductive, like what does that look like for corporate I, America? I do, for, um, and this was something actually that the US Business Coalition came together and really thought about and, and talked about. They all reaffirmed the importance of preventative services as a result of Braidwood um, and came out and talked about from a business case, what does it mean to provide? Do you wanna say what Braidwood, just for, I understand like, we're oh, nerds, but like we're nerds, <laughs> cool okay. nerds, but 
Do you just want to like so that a was sentence? just briefly? Yeah. Um, so, uh, so it was the case that sort of uh, went after and attacked a portion of the Affordable Care Act. Uh, really, the clause uh, around the pro provision of preventative services, and so things like cancer screening, access to prep. Um, uh, so you can get those things for, with no out-of-pocket right. costs because of the ACA. Yeah. Yeah. So they went, mm -mm, nope, strike all that down. Uh, and so right now we have a stay, uh, and the administration is committed to doing whatever it can to ensure full access to that aspect of the Affordable Care Act, especially when it comes to preventive services. So the business coalition all came together and reminded all of them as employers the importance of preventive services to their employees and sort of reaffirmed that this is an important part of insurance coverage and there is a business case for why you want employees to be screened early and have access to preventive services. So there definitely, definitely is that. Um, I think the other thing that sort of what happened with Roe and what sort of really made me stand up and take notice is that back in the day there were three things that would cause me to put on my dark martins. One was HIV marches, um, gay rights marches, and also marches around reproductive health for women. So now in NARAL, when we, were, when we were all going up to the mall, I was with them and all this, I thought Roe was done. I thought, you know, that had been decided and, and I kind of feel like I'd taken my eye off the ball. And so the, the sort of aha moment for me is we must stay vigilant when it comes to our rights. Um, in that many of the things that we thought were done and were settled might not. And in a blink of an eye, someone will try to take those rights away. And so my takeaway from this whole thing is, you know, the, I've been looking at the boots again and I'm ready to march when now and NARAL are all ready to march. But at the same time, really thinking about what does this mean for other rights that I thought were sort of guaranteed, solid, didn't have to march anymore, didn't have to fight, didn't have to write checks, all the rest of that. Now I'm looking at things a little bit differently uh, in light of it, and and it, they keep me up at night. Yeah, I'll just weigh in a little bit just to say not only are these two um, issue areas inextricably linked in a theoretical sense, in that it's about bodily autonomy or reproductive uh, rights are so much about the infringements thereof are so much about policing a certain kind of womanhood, and when we're talking about these bills that are attacking LGBTQ community, it's about policing how a person does gender and how they live out that way. These things are inextricably linked on that theoretical level. But I also think about the practicals. The reality that, frankly, in a lot of places in this country, the primary place you can go to to get gender-affirming care is Planned Parenthood. And so that literally, like, the brick and mortar of access to care is intertwined in that way. Um, but on the other side of things, I also think about how these laws are following a very similar playbook. You really get into the weeds of them. I'm a lawyer, it's what I do. You see things where it is not just a ban on care, but also a ban on traveling to get care. And we've seen that follow the same roadmap as what happens in the reproductive context. So we're keeping an eye out for that kind of restriction on freedom of movement, the concerns about your data history, whether it's, you know, date of last menstruation or what medical uh, care you're getting. These are all so intertwined that way. But on the, on the positive side of things, they are also intertwined in the same way that when the general public really hears real stories and understands and thinks compassionately about what this topic really means, whether it is a person who is deciding to uh, get an abortion or a person who is receiving gender affirming care, you don't need to understand it. It doesn't need to be your life. But uh, we know from the polling, we know from public opinion that the other side has gone way out over their skis on this. That support really isn't there when you really do understand the issues at hand. Okay, I, you know, I'm from Arizona. I'm a, my, my family is, I'm a Mexican American, fourth generation from Arizona. My, my mom and her sisters. Um, I wouldn't say they're politi pol like political in any sense, um, but I have had like literal conversations like that at Christmas and other times with my family where my aunts have said, I don't get it. Why don't they just leave people alone, right? Like, and I think you're exactly right. That, that doesn't, it doesn't, you don't have to be a particular person or watch a particular thing, but just that you have that recognition of, you know, 
people are people and let people be people, healthcare is healthcare. Um, so I think we're getting close to time. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and do one more question and then we can just do quick final remarks. Um, so again, I, I wanna talk a little bit about, um, we've talked about youth and we've talked about the suicide um, rates around the country and, and sort of how the, the movement is tired. Um, and so I'm just, in your words, in your personal capacity or in your you know, formal chair that you're sitting here today, what is your advice for um, you know, families and parents and providers in this space across the country who, um, you know, a lot of them don't live in states where they have governments that are necessarily representing them or inclusive of who they are or their health care. What, what would you say to them? Um, how would you, what would you say to them? I think, I think often, Harold, uh, um, President Biden, when he talked about um, these kids are made in the image of God. And I've had many parents come up to me, and I know the White House has had the same, and, and just really just be so thankful that the President of the United States, who is a devout Catholic, um, say those words and that, that they felt seen and they felt loved by this administration. And so um, I, I won't top that, but I think if we could just talk a little bit about that and what we're saying to the community right now, what we're saying to people on the ground. For me, I am so often inspired by the young people who, specifically the ones who reach out to Trevor Services, precisely because they have the courage to ask for help. Uh, we've danced around it a little bit today. One of the major challenges we face is still the ongoing stigma that is applied to seeking help, seeking mental health support. And the young people that we hear from are the ones who are brave enough to reach out for, know they need help, and ask for it. And that is something that I'm trying to take a lesson from, honestly. I am glad to know that there are advocates who have taken advantage of calling 988 and think that that's a safe place to call. Trevor's been very proud to be part of that pilot program for LGBTQ youth. Because yeah, this is a season where we are tired and we cannot do this alone and trying to is a failing strategy. So my advice is ask for the help you need. There are more people out there who will stand with you, who will hold you up than you know. And I guess to add to that, I would say to all of those out there that there is help available too. So ask for help and there is help available. Um, in the work that I did uh, a couple of weeks ago, really talking to black faith leaders about how to do no, don't do harm and, and where resources like the Trevor Project are to be able to help individuals and families who are all going through this and, and who are struggling. Um, and, and the fact that help can come from a lot of different sectors. Um, you know, even us sort of being here together uh, as LGBTQ plus individuals uh, and standing up and being role models. And, you know, I love your last slide. I might have to get a picture of that. But about the things that we can do, um, there is a lot of help. And I guess what I'll add to those great thoughts is um, the fact that we will win. <laughs> We're gonna get through this. And the reason I know that, you know, uh, Secretary, Secretary Becerra said this morning that there's so many Americans who are with us on this, they just don't know it yet, right? Um, and I think that's very true. When we think about, you know, so many, so many Americans, uh, regular folks in our country, the first they've heard about trans folks and trans community have been these hateful, hateful messages and the misinformation and the wrong, um, terrible attacks. Um, and we are coming through with our message of love and our you know, message of joy and our message of who we really are as a community. Um, and when we, you know, it takes a little longer for love to get through than hate, right? Hate's very flashy and people are picking up. <laughs> But love and joy, you know, they do come through in the end. And so we're, we're coming through, you know, we're showing people who we are as a community and, and we're gonna get there. We're going to make progress. Um, so, so hang in there, right? Yeah, and I would just add, um, so, so plus one and all those things, um, but thank you, right? A lot of you in the room do a lot of work, like whether you're, um, I'm, I'm looking at you and you're very famous, um, uh, Adrian, um, and uh, the work that you do nationally with the work that you do in the states, um, and the, you're, like, the work, you're doing it, and so thank you. Um, and that's from me, and that's from the department. Thank you for all that you're doing. Um, and then I think, you know, yes, love, la, 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 but also, like, <laughs> let's stand up, right? Like, we need everyone in the room. We need the community. We need our allies, and let's freaking fight. And you know what? Let's do it. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you so much. All right, y'all. We have one more panel. Um, I'm not sure how we're going to transcribe Director Rayner's la 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 la, but it was a, it was a good, but it was a good reminder too that, you know, I think at this point in the in the summit, people are ready to take action, and they want to get back out there and fight the good fight. The last conversation we'll have, at least for today, is going to focus on state health access issues. And we're going to talk to individuals who are on the ground fighting the good fight. Um, and they'll tell you some uh, best practices as to how to advance, the, advance the, the cause. So today we have Julie Siever, Executive Director, Compass LGBTQ Community Center of Florida. We have Robert Salcido. Executive Director, the Center of Pride Center in San Antonio. And we have Kelly Blair, Founder, Diversity Center of Oklahoma. And this discussion will be moderated by Adrian Shanker, Senior Advisor on LGBTQ Plus Health Equity. Thank you. What a great day so far. We've heard from Secretary Becerra and Admiral Levine, um, uh, Director Fontes Rayner, uh, of course, White House Press Secretary. So it's been a really exciting day. I'm Adrian Shanker, he, him pronouns. I'm Senior Advisor um, at HHS on LGBTQI Health Equity. I have the honor of serving um, under the leadership of Admiral Levine. Um, and before joining HHS, I actually led a pair of LGBT centers, so I really know how important it is the work that all of you do on the ground um, in states, in your cases, states that are passing restrictive laws that are challenging and undermining the health of LGBTQI plus people. So um, actually, let's start there. Um, uh, what has it been like to lead an LGBTQI plus community center um, in your states, in Texas, in Florida, in Oklahoma, uh, during the last year as these um, laws have really, th these um, ideological attacks um, at the state level have really ramped up? Uh, Julie, we'll start with you. Thank you so much. My name is Julie, and I'm the executive director of Compass, the LGBTQ community center in the Palm Beaches in the state of Florida. My pronouns are she and hers. Thank you, Adrian, for um, having us here today. I think that um, while it has been incredibly difficult, um, and it's been actually a source of inspiration um, listening to all of our national uh, and governmental leaders here in this room today for this Pride Summit, and it really gives me hope in that at least this administration supports us. So what happens when you are living in a state um, that your government and elected officials don't support you and are actively working against you, um, passing bad laws. Um, it has effects on all of the things that we've talked about today. Um, discrimination uh, in housing, in health care, in employment. It has discrimination in medical service providers. Um, not just our LGBTQ students are going through challenges of going to school and feeling safe in the schools that they're uh, attending, but nine times out of ten, most youth come out to um, an inclusive and welcoming school teacher or guidance counselor, and in the state of Florida, that is not happening. As a matter of fact, we've been focused a lot on um, the plight of LGBTQ youth and the challenges that they're going through, um, but also LGBTQ employees in the state of Florida um, and our employer workplaces. Uh, if, if you're not welcome, if you're not feeling welcome and uh, that you have the same access to uh, job security, food security, uh, equitable housing, all of those things that the rest of the United States takes for granted um, in your own workplace, if you can get a job, um, then then the rest of your 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 whole life is circled around not feeling safe, not feeling safe in your home, not safe uh, in your schools, and not safe in your workplaces. And so, while it has been incredibly difficult, um, I'm looking forward to having this conversation today with my colleagues from Texas and. Oklahoma. Robert? 
Thank you, Julie. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Robert Salcido. I use he, him pronouns, um, and I have the honor of serving as the executive director for Pride Center San Antonio, uh, located in South Texas. Um, I think Julie and I can probably uh, share multiple notes on what is happening in our states. Um, it, they almost mirror each other, if, if, if that's the best way to look at it, unfortunately. Um, you know, navigating uh, the space within our center um, this year um, and previous years um, has been difficult, very difficult. Um, but what I would say is that this is not a new landscape for us. Um, this is something that we've been facing session over session over session, um, but it has increased in the number um, and the intensity um, of which we've seen it this year. Um, you know, the number that has been shared ranging between 500 to 650, depending upon how you count it and how you slice and dice the, the laws that are being proposed, over 140 of them were in my state. Um, and so we just ended our legislative session at the end of May, and I'm, I'm disheartened to say, but I'm also happy to say that only eight of those laws were passed through. Um, but it's like, what, how do we navigate that space, and how have we, uh, you know, been doing so this year? Um, with our center, our anchor is primarily mental health. We offer free case management, counseling services, group therapies, um, mostly to folks who are uninsured and underinsured in our community. Um, you know, I like to say we serve the most vulnerable, yet the most resilient folks. Um, and so navigating that space of how do we uh, provide the services that we offer um, in a larger capacity um, with limited resources. Um, you know, one of the perils of living in Texas and, and working in Texas is that we don't have the resources that are available as in, in other states, um, either because our state uh, does not extend those um, or they decline funds from like the federal level, um, and so it doesn't pass through um, as easily. So again, working in in an area where we have to really just use the resources that we have available to us. Um, we know we've certainly seen an increase in our services um, and what's needed from a mental health perspective. Um, you know, one of the other things that we're navigating is how do we work with school districts and district leaders um, to, to help our youth? Um, you know, one of the things, as Julie had mentioned, is that oftentimes when our youth are coming out or when they need to navigate that space, they turn to guidance counselors or their teachers. Well, when, you know, our states are making it illegal for them to even mention it or have those conversations with the teacher for fear that they're going to be fired, or just like a recent law that was just passed and signed into law is where guidance counselors can now be unlicensed, ordained, uh, you know, clergy. Um, and so what does that do for youth that they're going into a guidance counselor's office thinking that they're going to receive that guidance that they're looking for um, and they are met with somebody who is opposed to who they are as the person? Um, so how do we start navigating those spaces and, and being able to, to uh, really identify what is the full scope of what our center can do? Um, obviously, as an LGBT Community Plus Resource Center, what we try to do is to fill those gaps of where they exist within our community. Um, you know, for a large portion of centers across the U.S., we are kind of everything to everyone. Um, we are that first stop where they come into us to identify what resources they need, and we help them where we can, and then we, with our community partners and our state partners, um, where, where can we you know, find the resources that they need for that? I think one of the other things that we're navigating uh, in, in my home uh, of San Antonio is you know, what does it look like for uh, the folks that are going to have to be taken out of care? Um, you know, the folks that are, um, and, and this is youth as well as adults, of like their, their health care providers um, are, are not providing these services any longer because one, it is either illegal for, because they're youth, or two, because they of the height and um, security that their offices are having to undertake because they're offering these gender affirming uh, uh, services. Um, and, you know, so when we, we think about everything that we're, we're doing in Texas is really just trying to navigate a space uh, where we can be as affirming as we can and then building safer spaces across the city, um, across the state. And I say safer spaces because we can never genuinely guarantee how safe a space is going to be. They can't guarantee a safe space for us here today. We can't guarantee a safe space for anybody. We don't know what people are going to do. But if we can build a culture of increasing the knowledge of who LGBTQ folks are and who we are not, because we know the misinformation, the disinformation is out there, um, just increasing the understanding of how do you work with our community better, and then us learning how can we work with our community even better navigating the spaces that we know that are happening because of these anti-LGBTQ and anti-trans laws. And Kelly? Um, my name is Kelly Blair. My pronouns are they and them. 
I am the CEO and the founder of the Diversity Center of Oklahoma, and we are a community resource center, um, like we say, in the heart of the neighborhood. And um, we specialize in transgender care, um, but we um, serve our whole community of um, 2S LGBT community. Um, at one time this last year, we had more um, bills against our community than any other state in the United States. Uh, and that was, um, I think that was a very overwhelming feeling for our community as a whole, just to know that uh, we had so many bills against us. I think our community, um, uh, felt the pressure of feeling uh, like so many people hated our our community and us identifying how we do. And so, <coughs> excuse me, um, we had a lot of people that would go on a consistent basis to the Capitol and help with lobbying and help supporting our legislative organization um, diversity does not have a legislative component, but we do advocate advocacy work, and so we go and we support other organizations um, as often as we can. So that was something that we've um, been doing quite a bit of. Um, but we have um, had restrictive access to care, especially when it comes to medical care. and. Diversity does have primary health care uh, as well as behavioral health. And as of last year, we are the only program in the state certified by the Attorney General to provide intimate partnerships um, services. And so um, those were some concerns that we would have is that uh, our grant funding might be affected by that. And so I think everyone um, including uh, some of our funding folks, but we had uh, have a really good attorney general that stepped up and said, uh, we are not allowing uh, our programs to be affected because we've been going around the past year and training other shelters uh, to be able to provide services uh, to our community. And so they might lose their funding, too, <laughs> if that were the case. Uh, and they all were uh, standing up for us, too. And I think that's really something interesting when I was listening to uh, my friends here is that um, our allies really had a challenge, um, too, is uh, sometimes we uh, you know, they try to network with us to provide, uh, get receive referrals and resources from us because that's something that we do. We give out resources to people. And um, they, they felt like that they didn't have resources anymore too um, because we, we've had to temporarily close our clinic. Um, some of the organizations were able to maintain their clinics there in Oklahoma City or in Oklahoma, um, but therefore why we weren't sure if we were gonna be able to provide services for our young people. Um, we're not under the age of uh, 18, 21, they can't get HRT, uh, our hormone treatment, and so our young folks are afraid uh, how am I going to get that? And even the government, our government made it where it was challenging to get uh, treatment for three months of prescriptions. So we couldn't even help them get three months of prescriptions um, so that they could be prepared to find another clinician. So uh, we've really had some challenges when it came to access to medical health care. 
Um, so we've we've continuously heard from, especially from trans youth and their families, um, that people feel under siege, under attack, uh, on a pretty daily basis in a number of states, as you've as you've highlighted. Um, and in addition to the legislative actions themselves, I'm wondering if you can speak briefly to um, the effect on people's mental health, the effect on um, even other services like HIV testing, for example, that you might offer. Uh, we've heard people talking about leaving or moving out of the state, what those conversations have been like at your community centers. And uh, just because um, we have a couple other questions we want to try to get to, we can try to be uh, brief in the responses. Again, we'll start with Julie. Thank you. So, um, so what we're experiencing, um, because all of this, all of these challenges um, really affect um, our mental health. And when we're talking about, we've been talking about today, the intersectionality of all of the populations that we serve. And Robert, you mentioned um, about being all things to all people. And so for those direct service providers like our community centers that are providing direct services and we're not at the state level, um, you know, advocacy and, um, you know, working with the legislators, um, it's really difficult to advocate for a community that you are a part of. And, you know, we're lucky in that through Centerlink, which is the network of LGBT centers across the nation, that we're able to discuss these challenges with each other and um, try to preserve our own mental health as leaders of these direct service organizations. And, you know, sometimes we all come together and we're like, it's not okay. It's not okay that you're not okay all the time. And I think that, you know, when we're providing all of these different programs from, so at the center that, that I work in, we serve age 70, seven years old to 97 years old. We have LGBTQ youth and families programs and we have seen an increase in services for mental health therapists. Um, we have an increase in our social and support groups for our LGBT elders who are feeling very isolated. And of course, you know, the air of concern, they're aging without um, their families. We're coming off of several pandemics, epidemics and all of those things. And so it's, it's really affecting everyone's mental health. And um, even though there are resources, and we've heard some from great organizations and funders of mental health today, um, for those small town community centers across America, um, the access to get those, those funding dollars to provide more resources for the community members that are working, walking in our doors every single day for help is, be, is, is always gonna be a challenge, right? And so I think that increasing collaborations with community partners and the larger organizations um, and making sure that uh, you can remain relevant in your own communities is gonna be the life-saving force that we're all gonna have to rely on each other and helping each other. Thank you, Robert. Yeah, so I, I think you brought up a good point is that it largely in, at least it is for our center, um, I would say 95% of our staff are LGBTQ plus identified. So taking care of their mental health as they're trying to uh, help others, it certainly um, you know, has been difficult this past year and, and in years past. Um, it, as it comes to the mental health of our, of our uh, community members that we serve, I think the biggest thing is just the unknown. Like, what do these new laws mean? What does it mean to navigate the space that we're in now? What does it mean for my care? You know, it, it's again, that, I think it's more of a stress factor that's built in um, to this, this scenarios and, and how that affects their mental health. Um, you know, in, at you know, Adrian's request to keep it brief, I'm gonna give you one example and I think it's gonna speak for itself. Um, so we have a young, uh, young trans person uh, who is preteen, um, is on puberty blockers, um, has started the transition process, fully supported by their family, um, and has probably been in their happiest year that they ha have in this transition of theirs. Um, as their parents were having conversations with them, 
um, about what this legislation may mean as we were approaching it through the session, um, and now that it is uh, signed into law, um, this young nine-year-old, the response to it was, well, then I only have two choices. One, to detransition, or two, to die. And for a nine-year-old to be able to have to say that, I think that's enough to say what's happening with the mental health of our youth um, because of laws like this, not to mention their parents. Uh, you had asked about um, uh, folks wanting to leave. Um, we ha have had conversations with, I, I'm a licensed behavioral health therapist, um, and I have had numerous therapists come to me and ask where are these safe havens at? What states are safe havens? And can we organize, uh, can we go through this, your center or can you link us with other centers? That way when they move to these other states, they can have a safe haven. Can we do an underground railroad so we can uh, relay our kids and our families to these different states that have affirming um, laws for our family? And so uh, in, in session, they're asking, uh, where can I take our family? Where can we go? Um, and so uh, not only children, but adults are looking to move because they're afraid. If the kids are going to end up losing services, that means myself as an adult will eventually lose services too. That's their fear. And so, um, and also, like you said, Robert, they, they are talking about detransitioning. Uh, I may have to detransition if I can't get my hormones or if I can't get my insurance to cover things. And so then um, we start talking about severe depression and suicide as an option. Uh, where could I go where it's legal where I could take my life? And, and those are the extremes that people are going through is where is it legal so I could take my life? And that's truly scary and sad to think that uh, those are the extreme things that people are wanting to take. Thank you all. Um, so I know from my past experience leading LGBT centers uh, myself that it can be really hard sometimes to um, uh, get the attention of national leaders from a community, right, to, to uh, make sure that what you're experiencing on the ground, what your community is experiencing in uh, West Palm Beach and San Antonio, and, and um, I didn't actually ask where in Oklahoma. Um, <laughs> Oklahoma City. Oklahoma City, um, uh, wh where, where your community centers are based, that what you're seeing every single day, um, you know, it needs to be elevated, that there is actually no, um, there's no movement for LGBTQI health equity uh, at the national level without community-based clinics and community centers and community organizations um, supporting people every, in every zip code in this country. So what's the one thing that you really hope um, national partners hear from you today in terms of um, what do your communities need most? What, what, what is it that you want to really make sure um, uh, you know, people hear about ongoing ways to support folks doing community-based work like you. We'll start with Kelly and go this way. I, I think um, it would be nice if people are aware of what's going on in our, in our areas that are really struggling with these different bills. Um, and recognize that um, our communities are are struggling and if they can call and say what can I do to support you you know um, and it's really hard for us um, I know they mentioned Centerlink I know our organization would not make it without Centerlink uh, because they provide um, mentorship you know, like my organization, people don't realize is ran by myself <laughs> and a handful of volunteers uh, and usually one employee, and that's it. 
And so uh, what helps us is funding, because uh, we serve um, a huge population in Oklahoma City. So those are kinds of things that we need help with. Yeah. It's funny because we were, when we were sitting over here listening to the presentations earlier, and one of them had uh, funding information about a grant that was available, and it was due on July 3rd. And we all giggled and laughed, and it was like, yeah, right after Pride Month, yeah. And, you know, and, and, you know half jokingly there, but, you know, I think when we talk about the work that we do in order to provide equity and health, we also need to think about equity in all its forms. And I'm thinking about equity when it comes to organizations um, to receive federal funding, to receive funding from large uh, foundations, n national foundations and other national partners, is make it equitable so that organizations that are actually on the, r the ground doing the work, grassroots organizations, that they qualify for the funding that is out there. Um, oftentimes, they don't have, we don't have the resources, you know, you know, as, you know, my colleague here, you know, right now it's an operation of one with many volunteers. When I first became the executive director of my center, it was just an operation of one, um, and I was a volunteer. Um, and so now that we have a larger center, um, you know, what are the requirements that are needed um, for us to apply for a SAMHSA grant? What is needed for us to apply for other federal funding? Um, and, and the reality is, is that even if we did qualify for it, do we have the capacity and the resources to be able to, one, fill out the application? That's one barrier. Two is do we have the capacity and the funding to have somebody that can follow through with the requirements of that grant and that funding? Um, and the reality is most of the time it's no. And so if we don't have equity when it comes to funding our, our small grass or grassroots organizations that are doing the work on the ground, then that further creates the inequitability in our communities that is going to create, further create the gap of health equity and equity in every form that we have. Um, so if, if any national partners in here, our federal funding partners, anybody, is to really assess and be intentional about the funding that you have and how you can get the, to maximize how it's distributed into the communities that actually need it. Julie? I am so glad that you said all of that. <laughs> I'm here to keep on. Absolutely. <laughs> um, so uh, we just want our national partners to know that that we see you and we hear you, but we need you to see us too. And so um, it is difficult being the direct service providers to all of these community members, and our our stories are your stories, and your stories are ours. And so remember that when you're putting out the the funding request uh, for proposals, and remember that when you are you have a seat at the table that we don't have a seat at that table. And so things like you know HHS hosting this Pride Summit so that we can air it across communities across the nation, that's providing access, that's representation, that's visibility. So thank you for seeing us. That's what we would ask. So um, bef before we wrap up, before our final, very exciting final speaker um, comes on, um, I, you know, I want to thank all of you for the work that you're doing in really tough um, uh, geographic climates uh, these days, uh, Texas, Florida, and Oklahoma. And, um, and I want to acknowledge that there's at least two other LGBT center leaders here as well from Virginia and Pennsylvania. Um, but that, you know, that, that as you're kind of um, continuing this work, know that uh, here at HHS and throughout the Biden administration that there's a lot of folks that really do uh, appreciate so much the work that you're doing to support trans kids every day, uh, trans adults, LGBTQI plus people broadly every single day. And as we're working to advance policy, um, we know how important it is that you're doing these programs on the ground. So uh, please join me in thanking our panelists. <laughs> Y'all, hello, you're a true survivors here. 
So I was going to read Deputy Secretary Palm's bio, but she said, I know who I am. <laughs> so I'll be very brief, uh, Deputy Secretary Palm. Um, in her role, she is a Chief Operating Officer for the Department, uh, which means she leads the day to day. Um, if I had to re uh, say one word to describe Deputy Secretary Palm, is that she's a doer. Um, so much of what you heard today of what the Department is, is, is doing is because of her tenacious ability to implement a vision and her ability to move us ahead. Um, and so without further ado, I'd like to call to the, to the podium Deputy Secretary Palm. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Oh. <laughs> I love that. It, often you have to do that more than once because you don't get the response that you're looking for, but not with this crowd. Um, I, I really just want to start by saying what an honor it is for me to have the opportunity to close out what it sounds like uh, has been a really um, meaningful uh, and powerful morning. Um, and so with much gratitude to the folks who uh, were on the stage before me and uh, the panels and to all of you, um, uh, I just want to say thank you for participating with us today. Um, we really have a lot, uh, achieved a lot of firsts uh, when it comes to supporting the health opportunities and prosperity of the LGBTQI plus community. And the Biden-Harris administration, as I'm sure you have heard throughout, recognizes and utilizes the power of lived experience when it comes to policy making. And as um, Marvin noted, I, I do um, sort of sit over day-to-day -day operations, so some of what you'll hear me talk about may be different than what you've heard today because I will focus on how we think about this from an enterprise, from an infrastructure perspective. Um, and the, the first of those is the fact that around 15% of our political appointees identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer. And, and these folks really do make our work stronger and our workplace better. Uh, and as Deputy Secretary, I am certainly proud to lead this team and to be a part of an enterprise that walks the walk and that strives to make not only our internal um, workings of HHS uh, equitable, but thinks about how we push that into the policies and the programs that we deliver for the American people every day. So here at HHS, we, we absolutely know and understand the importance of elevating LGBTQI plus voices. Uh, our LGBTQI plus coordinating committee meets monthly, and they're uh, helping us drive and be accountable uh, and move forward uh, how this department functions, how it moves, how we see and experience this work together, and how we lift up these voices. And we have new guidance, again, thinking about our enterprise internally. We've new, we have new guidance on gender identity, um, which is a, which is a non-discrimination non policy here at HHS that really does in, ensure that transgender and non-binary employees are treated with dignity in their places of work, uh, as well as having recently updated our Microsoft Teams platform to turn on the pronouns function so that people can um, can use uh, that platform uh, and be clear about um, what, their what their pronouns are, how they identify in those, in those settings. So we've, we've covered a lot of ground. There is a lot more to do, um, and we need to continue to make sure that the work we do is meaningful um, and that really advances for our LGBTQI neighbors, coworkers, coworkers and loved ones um, uh, the efforts that uh, we really try are trying to bake into all the policies and programs that uh, the American public experiences. As President Biden has said a number of times, transgender Americans are some of the bravest people he knows, but nobody should have to be brave to be themselves. We're working across this administration towards not only a brighter future for all Americans, but a future period for LGBTQI plus youth, who often face mental health crisis and, and other um, challenges uh, in which uh, they feel their only option is to do something like contemplate ending their life by suicide. And, and we know from uh, some of our research here at HHS, uh, our, specifically our U.S. National Survey on Mental Health of LGBTQI lung, young people, um, that 41 percent of these young people seriously considered suicide in the past year, and that trans youth reported much higher rates than that. This is work that is, al are, these are facts, excuse me, that, are, that is alarming to us and in which we are very focused. 
So we're focused on building uh, support and a network for LGBTQI youth. Um, and we know that this is, it's really critical for them to have access to the services and supports that they need to be seen and to be heard. And it's why we partnered with folks like the Trevor Project to bring specialized crisis services through the 988 hotline to this population. So I know we've got a lot more work to do. I know that we've done uh, meaningful things. We must continue to make progress in this space. We must continue uh, to, to, to stem the backslide and this month and the next 11 months and the 12 months after that are months in which we all need to do this work together. So again, much appreciation for your participation today. These conversations are critical. We really must continue to have them um, so that we are together uh, moving forward and holding each other accountable for making progress towards true equity for all Americans. Thank you again so very much for being here today. I'm your last speaker. There you go. So I have nothing but the most important announcements. Um, one, someone left their bracelet here. Uh, the bracelet is out in the front. If it is yours, please claim it. Two, please leave your name tags here. Uh, I presume that people know you at home, so go ahead and, and, and drop off your, your uh, name tag before you leave. And then three, please use the hashtag Happy Pride or hashtag Pride Month. So those are my, my three announcements. Let me say a couple of things in closing. Um, this has been a great, great, great morning, great afternoon. Uh, really want to thank you for joining us today and celebrating all the progress that we made, um, but also recommitting to the work ahead. Um, echoing Secretary Becerra, uh, the Biden-Harris administration is a real partner uh, based on real friendship, um, real honesty, and this fundamental American idea uh, that we all have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I also want to say that sometimes when you work in, in these kind of jobs, the, the things that you do are abstract. So let me kind of bring it home to you and how I see this. I was in Idaho not too long ago. Uh, we visited an FQAC center down there, or up there. And we were meeting with all the different administrators, talking about governance, wait times, the services they provide. And we went around the table and had that kind of conversation. And there was a person who identified as LGBTQI. And I asked, the, I asked the person, why do you come to this center? And the person said, it's because they see me. Uh, this is the first place that I have went to where they're treating my blood pressure as opposed to trying to change me. And I think I'm reminded, especially in the, in the conversation that we had throughout the day, about the importance of hope, but it's also the importance of joy and celebrating where we are, even as we acknowledge that we have much more to do. So as we close this time together, I want to thank you again, and I want to thank those for their commitment, for their commitment in front of disbelief and dismissal, and the acknowledgement that because of the work that you have done, we're going to meet the moment. So thank you all. Peace, love, and pride. Produced by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services.